Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to another episode of the Shots Fired podcast. And uh, we are super pumped with our uh, next guest to uh, introduce to you guys. So let's just dive right into it. Um, He was born and raised in Southern California in the surf city of Huntington Beach. After graduating high school in 2006, he immediately joined the Navy with the goal of becoming a Navy SEAL. After completing Navy SEAL training, he went on to complete the Special Operations Combat Medic course. From there, he was stationed at SEAL Team 4, where he completed two successful combat deployments to Afghanistan. He went on to becoming a Navy SEAL BUDS instructor and was able to mentor and develop future SEALs. After his time as an instructor, he returned to SEAL Team uh, Team 4, where he served uh, another deployment while completing his Bachelor's of Science in Criminal Justice. And currently, he's enrolled in his master's program. Uh, From there, he became the leading chief petty officer running the Special Operations Urban Combat uh, Training Division, And in this role, he focused on urban tactics, combat shooting, and professional development. In April of 2019, he separated from the military and started his own business, which is known as Kennedy Defensive Solutions. After uh, using his 11 years as a Navy, Navy SEAL, he trained civilians and law enforcement officers on defensive shooting tactics and instilling the thinking shooter mindset, which uh, we're going to touch on. He currently serves as a police officer in Southern California and uh, ladies and gentlemen, he makes Keanu Reeves and Point Break look like an amateur. Ladies and gentlemen, Travis Kennedy. I love hey, thanks, it. Travis, for coming on, man. Appreciate it. No, thank you, uh, Kyle and Billy. I appreciate you, man. Honor to be yeah. here. Thank you again for inviting me to uh, speak on your podcast. Appreciate it. Yeah, for sure. I, I had to throw the Point Point Break thing in there because, I mean, you know, That's it's one of my boys, favorite so. movies. <laughs> Is it? <laughs> Nice. Some people listening to this are probably going, what's Point Break? <laughs> the but, original one, not the new no, one. No, the original yeah. one. The new one sucked. <laughs> yeah. The yeah, original yeah. So one's all, I, all day. Yeah. I, I see you got rid of your uh, long surfer hair, so, I mean, <laughs> it's all good, though. Yeah. Um, hey, anyways, dude, so welcome. Uh, thanks for taking time out of your night to do this. We, we, we do appreciate it. Um, why don't you introduce yourself a little bit, kind of tell us your background, uh, where you grew up, and let's kind of segue into what got you into the military. Yeah, so I grew up in, in SoCal, the city of Huntington Beach. Um, it's basically now in the surf capital of the U.S. I mean, everyone comes here for surfing, but I grew up really, I did a little bit of surfing, but was always into sports, mainly lacrosse. Um, looking ahead, I always like looked, always looked big goal setter, but I always knew I kind of wanted to be involved with the military about when I got into high school. But when I was in high school, I wasn't really sure what I wanted to do in the military. I was kind of dabbling around. I knew I just didn't want to just join and do whatever job. Like I wanted to set a higher kind of goal for myself. Originally, I thought about pilot and then um, going to the Naval Academy. Then that like was a, a pipe dream. Then have the grades for it. it wasn't that I just lost motivation for going to that type of college. Um, but actually, my father, he's the one that like kind of introduced me to the SEAL teams because he knew I was interested. So he kind of did his homework. Um, was like, cause he wasn't all about me just joining to be a grunt or whatever. He kind of wanted me to do something unique in the military. So he actually brought home like this pamphlet. They used to hand out pamphlets about te- the SEAL teams. And basically when I got that, that's when I got fired up and my whole mindset kind of shifted and it was just like front sight focus on that goal. Pretty much the rest of school, the rest of high school. Like I really started training about. And a sophomore, and then all the way through junior, because I enlisted in the Navy the summer of my senior year. So over you know a year and a half, close to two years, I was just like all about it. You know, I still played sports, but I was like freaking my training was focused towards SEAL teams running, swimming, calisthenics. And when I enlisted in uh, the summer of, it was like 05, uh, I graduated in 06. Uh, had the buzz contract and I left in July of um, 2006. Basically that summer after I graduated, uh, went to boot camp. So not, I wasn't, I graduated and a couple months later, I just left because I already had I, that delayed entry program. So it sets you up. So you don't have to freaking wait forever. Um, joined, 
went to boot camp, went to core school. I had to pick a job when I joined. So it was like, hey, back then, you, nowadays, you don't need to pick a job, a, basically a fail safe. When I joined, you had to pick a job because SEAL wasn't like its own job. It was kind of like a specialty. Uh, so I picked medic, corpsman, a Navy corpsman because I thought, hey, this is some good transferable skills. Like, this is going to benefit me. Uh, did that. It was like, I can barely, it was like nine weeks long, the, the training after boot camp. Boot camp was eight weeks. I went to core school, it was about nine weeks. And then from there, I went to Buds in the summer of like 07. So, and then from there, Buds, I went, I started with 266, uh, 266 Buds class. And I graduated with Buds class 267. Uh, from there, I went to SQT. Uh, so I graduated around 2008 and then went to SQT, which is SEAL qualification training for those listening. That's about four months long. Basically, Buds, it kind of grooms you, gives you the fundamentals. You know, you, you just it challenge you like physically, mentally um, throughout like each phase is seven weeks long and there's three phases. So you got like first phase, which is the basically just like mental, physical beat down. Second phase focused on diving. Third phase focuses on like demolition, marksmanship, land warfare, kind of shooting. That's when you kind of learn like second and third phase when you learn those fundamental skill sets of like being a SEAL. Yeah. And then SQT is where you hone it. Then you kind of learn more advanced skill sets, techniques, and you're honing your skills to go after that. It's basically, you go to a team. But for me, I was a little different because I had the, the foreman background when I finished SQT. They needed medics and they knew I was like, I was basically, I was one of two guys that went to core school in my buds class. And they, I basically got phone told like, Hey, Travis, you're going to the um, 18 Delta course, which is the, the army 18 Delta course where army SF Green Berets go to. It's a joint, all, all branches go, but um, the army owns it. And I went there. I did the short course. Special Operations Combat Medic 18 Delta is like the long course they call it. Basically, you stay there for a year. I did the half that, which is about six, seven months. Um, at the time, they asked me if I wanted to stay, but at the time, dude, I was just like so eager to get to the SEAL teams at that point. Um, a lot of my friends were like already there, someone already overseas. Um, so I was kind of behind the group, the pack a little bit. So I said, no, I, want, I just want to go. Um, Funny thing, I put in for West Coast teams, and they came back and like, nope, you're going to East Coast teams. I mean, because naturally, I put in West Coast teams. I'm from the West Coast, and there's shit about um, Virginia. I had no motivation to go there. Um, but so I ended up getting still team four. It's in Virginia Beach. Uh, so I was kind of I was a little bit uh, pissed about that and bitter. But looking back, um, I loved it. I mean, I wouldn't I wouldn't change it. At all because the teams are great. And then I met my, you know, basically I lived there for like over 10 years. So great friends, you know, great relationships. I, it grew on me. Um, so I showed up to two, team four around May 09, May of 2009. So team four, a new guy. I was the medic. Yeah. There, and at the time there was like myself and one older medic and kind of in the still teams, like, once you're the new medic, the old medic kind of grooms you and you, you do everything. Because SEALs wear so many hats. You know, the, a, a one SEAL could be like a sniper, a breacher, a medic. You know, th so there's like, SEALs wear a lot of hats. So when, when if someone is new there, like a new medic, like, hey, that's going to be your hat for a little while. Just that. So learn everything you can about it because you'll be, you'll be task saturated later down in the career. But. Still team four, first, and I went on, basically did a full workup, which is like a year, a year long, and then you do a six month long deployment. So ULT, they call it unilateral training, basically just a bunch of different training, um, pipeline you go through, um, that each, every SEAL team does. You know, it stems from like seek, you know, close quarters combat, land warfare, diving, skydiving, et cetera, just to build those skill sets. At the end of that, then you go on deployment. My first deployment was to Afghanistan as a new guy. Uh, I was there for about seven months from 2010 to 11. Uh, kind of in September, I got to 2010. 
Uh, and I was there for about seven months. I, I left the following year. And yeah, that was a good deployment. Kind of eye opening for me, especially being a new guy and going to a combat zone. Everyone was fired the fuck up, especially because, you know, back, back before when I showed up, team guys, some team guys, like platoons were going to Iraq, like early days of Iraq when we invaded. Um, so we had some skills who had that experience. Uh, but mo- the majority didn't have any of that. I mean, if we're not at war, SEALs are at Europe, they're doing their training with other partner forces. They're in South America or they're, they're staying CONUS, basically in states. So before, at that point, like not every SEAL basically had war experience like nowadays. Um, basically when I left, like every team guy has been overseas, you know, and got after it in the combat zone. But went there, definitely eye-opening for me. I was young. I was like 22, 23. Uh, I was pretty young. I joined when I was 18, so uh, I was not old. Um, but it was good. I had a lot of good experiences, uh, a lot of responsibility. And basically when I was there, I was basically the primary medic. The good thing being a medic, which kind of benefited me throughout my entire career, was I get to go on every off, every mission. Because you have to have a medic with them, uh, with you at all time. So it was never kind of really sidelined because there wasn't that many medics to begin with. And they always need me because they have to be able to even step outside that front gate, you need a medic. So I was, I was fortunate enough to be like, yeah, I've got to go on a, pretty much all missions. Um, that's cool. That's, that's awesome. And, and as a medic, you're, you're not like, you're, like you said, you're wearing many hats. So you're, you're an operator first and yep. then a medic secondary, basically. Yeah, operator first. That's that's kind of like the mentality of SEALs. You're operator first, you're a shooter first, and then you're secondary and tertiary dues, whatever other skill set you bring to the table. And no, okay. no one gives – a like, funny thing is like no one really cares about a medic until they actually need one. Yeah. <laughs> until, they, until they need you? Yeah. No one yeah. gives yeah. a shit like, oh, about shit, what you're a medic? until they're like hurt or they need some like medications yeah. or you know, <laughs> cleanup shot or something. So Yeah. <laughs> So just to backtrack a little bit, um, and then I want to get into your second deployment because I know that th- that one was obviously a lot different than your first one just from listening to you on other podcasts and doing some research. But um, so right at, basically right out of high school, I mean, when you joined the Navy, I mean, uh, you said you had to pick a secondary job assignment. Did you have to go to that first or did you um, – how does it work to get into BUDS? I mean, do you get to go right into BUDS after boot camp or – No, I mean, that work? When I, back when I joined in 06 – when I told him, Hey, I want to, I want to become a seal. Like that's my end goal here. So you basically it would put in your contract, but at the same time, you're like, Hey, what, these are the jobs that coincide with the seal kind of pipeline. And it wasn't mm-hmm. like every job in the Navy was like 10 and you know, like aviation ordinance, like radar tech, Intel or some like random jobs. Um, mm-hmm. but Corman medic was on there. So I was like, I'm picking that, uh, that was at least it was interesting to me, and I knew in the back of my mind, like, hey, that's gonna be some decent skill sets yeah. that I could use if all else. How fails. many guys join the Navy? Like, if I some, something happens to me, I had no no quitting yeah. in mind, but like, if I got hurt or whatever reason, um, I could fall back on it. Maybe I can go work for the Marines because Marines use Navy corpsmen, FMF corpsmen. So there's a lot of different yeah. kind of avenues for that. But yes, I had to complete that first before I went to Buds. Okay. How many guys like join the Navy and they say, they're like, I want to be a Navy SEAL and get like probably last hat. I mean, that's probably, is that not like common? Or? Nowadays, it, nowadays it's different. Nowadays, basically SEAL is its own rating and job. So guys would show up there and like, hey, I want to be a SEAL. Okay. Well, do you uh-huh. meet ASVAB score? Okay. Do you meet the physical fitness standards? Cool. If you do, you get all that. And then they have this whole pipeline where you actually do, you go to boot camp. And you're in a division in boot camp with all guys that want to be SEALs, SWIC, EOD, explosive ordnance technicians. So you're kind of grouped along. Mm. And then after boot camp, you go to like another eight week training cycle. But basically, you just PT and get ready. And then you go to BUD. So you don't do any type of other, they call it A school. They don't, um, you don't yeah. do that nowadays. Huh. Okay. So. Tell us what, it, what what was it like, like your first day of walking into Buzz School? Like it was obviously a dream of yours. You finally get there. Um, I mean, what was that like walking walking into that? 
from your own personal experience. Yeah, like your first day at Buds, like this is it. Because from there, it's make it oh, or break it. Oh, yeah, I was it. fucking nervous. <laughs> I was nervous as shit. I was like, I didn't even know what the hell I was getting myself into, <laughs> to be honest. I kind of only knew, because nowadays, I mean, there's so much information out there. You could just find every freaking every day of the week yeah. in that training pipeline. But back then, I couldn't, um, I didn't know that much. Mm-hmm. I only knew like what I read in books and um, kind of word of mouth. But yeah, I was I was pretty freaking nervous. But I, I, and excited at the same time, because especially when i got there i was like all right this is it because mm-hmm. i it was a lot of kind of prep work up to that point yeah um but and it's do or die right i mean like you either, yeah, you either I do mean, it or you if you decide you don't want to do it then you're done right you're out. yeah exactly i mean you show you get all the way to that point you know, you checked in like and you're about to class up and stuff like that you know with other classmates it's like it's it's good it's show time or get the hell out yeah you know, or quit so is the is the <laughs> no belt- one cares how how much you you've done or how old you are. So just, you just got to perform at that point in the beginning. It's got to perform. Yeah. yeah. Is that bell thing real? Like you can ring the bell, like legit. You, yeah. That's how it is. Anytime, any hour of the day. I mean, every training evolution, they, they tie it in the back of the, the bed of the truck on the toe hitch. <laughs> oh, really? And it follows you around. No shit. Okay. So it's like, it's always right there staring at you. So it's like, like that's like people saving grace. Like I'm out. Man. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. How often are guys like, I mean, so, I mean, the first week is, um, you know, I don't know, you guys are probably just getting beat down, um, tested. And then when you guys roll into hell week, is that like week two or week three? No, hell week is the fourth week. So you got three weeks. So each phase is seven weeks. So the first phase is seven weeks. So the first three weeks is basically, I mean, you're just getting pounded. And you're basically kind of building your body up too to, for that fourth week, Hell Week. Because uh, Hell Week starts on a Sunday and it goes mm-hmm. till Friday afternoon, like Sunday night to Friday afternoon. Okay. But yeah, the, the three weeks leading up to it, you're just, you're getting hammered. Yeah. And, and we, you know, we've all heard war stories of, uh, of Hell Week and obviously how difficult it is. Sleep deprivation for one, right? I mean, you're, you're literally getting like no sleep. Yeah. We got like, you get no sleep, you get two naps. I get, I think we did two two hour naps. That's crazy throughout, throughout the week, and yeah. it was like that's like the middle of the week. So first couple of days you ain't you're not sleeping, and then it kind of like Tuesday or like Wednesday comes around when you're basically when you get to Wednesday, Wednesday night is like the pinnacle. It's like all right, mm-hmm. we're making it. <laughs> really? Yeah. Because it kind of it's like downhill at that point. You gotta get to that hump day, and but yeah, two out two two hour naps throughout the week. I kind of feel like that's a little bit like working graveyard. But, <laughs> yeah. Um, except way harder. I mean, exactly. <laughs> I, I'm not even. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I think I average like three hours of sleep a day. So, I mean, and then ro- rolling to work. But, um, so, uh, like, give us some, give us some, um, some, some, uh, your worst experience in Hell Week. I mean, what, what to you was the hardest thing? You know, I, I've heard stories from running, swimming, um, just not being able to sleep. Um, you know, being yeah. cold. I think, I mean, the hardest kind of physical event for me was running. Uh, mm-hmm. I struggled with running like halfway through first phase, like after hell week, like my body was just so broken down. Like, I don't know. I just, I wasn't a good runner. When I look back at it, I'm like, damn, I just wasn't really prepped enough. I didn't train enough running because I did a hell of a lot of swimming and I crushed swimming. Mm-hmm. I think I just didn't, Think I think I thought I ran enough when I was prepping for buds, but when I got there, man, you run like twice as much as you swim. So really, I just didn't have the legs. But kind of that was like the the time physical test that was really tough for me, and yeah. kind of everything like all the all the stuff with the boats logs yeah. for me was okay. Like and then that, it's this still sucked, but the worst thing I'd say like the mental gut check was was the boats like running running with them on top of your head not paddling really? with them in the ocean. That was kind of, that, I mean, that, that sucked, but it was, you're paddling with your boat crew, but doing yeah. with that thing bounced on your head, doing like racetrack sprints around, you know, the instructors and you got like people falling out not carrying their weight. Um, yeah. For me, that, for me, that was kind of the shittiest evolution and the toughest one too. How long are you guys running every day? All day, dude. I mean, not <laughs> only that, 
we do like conditioning. We have time runs once a week, conditioning runs. Like you're running to and from um, every meal. So one way is a mile. So every meal you're mm -hmm. running back and forth. And then you're running to and from every training evolution throughout the base. So the miles add up. So it's not like it's all cumulative. Basically, that's what breaks people down. Um, yeah. And it, kind of like the leading injury there is stress fractures, like on, on your sh on people with the guys with shin. So it's, really? it's at the running. It's like that bud shuffle, like that short little shuffle step on the pavement, running in boots. I mean, it screws people up. Uh, and if you're not, if you're not prepped for that, if you're not used to getting those miles on your feet, that needs to be top priority. Cause I, I always tell people that they always ask me, what do you, what would you train differently or advise somebody like, run, mm -hmm. run, run, run. Cause it's going to yeah. pay dividends. Yeah. I, I hate, I hate running too. And I'm built to like run and I, I, I suck at it. So yeah, I could, I think I would struggle in that for sure. <laughs> um, <clears throat> okay. So Obviously you get through hell week. How many guys dropped out during that, during that time frame? I would imagine probably from like week one to the end of hell week. That's, is that probably like the bulk of like when guys drop out of. Yeah. Of like buds? that first four weeks you lose 70%. I mean, jeez. Like throughout first guys, days, that's when you get all the quitters. I mean, that's when that, that bulk people say it's like over 80% dropout rate. Yeah. Like we finished with like 33 guys and we started with mm -hmm. over a hundred, like 150, 100. Something like that. So basically, whatever yeah. you lead into Hell Week with, you'll lose fifty percent of that number in Hell Week wow. alone. That's amazing. That's crazy. So those guys, like in your opinion, do they think you, they think they do you think they came in like oh, I'll give it a try, or was it more of like uh, I can't do it? Like they came in and said this is what I want to do, or was it like eh, I'll give it a try if I can't do it, I can't do it? Yeah, I mean, most guys, I, I don't know, like. Looking when I was a student, like most guys when I, that I talked to were just were passionate about it and they wanted to do the job. And um, but like fast forward, when I was an instructor, I would ask that question to people, and then I would find more often that oh, just you know, I'm here for the challenge. I didn't. I just wanted to see if I could do it. I just wanted to see if I could yeah, just complete really. Hell Week. I'm like, you're in the wrong state of mind because they end up quitting anyway. So I think yeah, when, yeah. when I was a student, like the majority of people were just there, kind of. Hey, I just wanted, I just think I could do it. I just wanted to try and see if I could just do this and be here. And that's not a concrete enough, you know, kind of why to make yeah. it through that program. I mean, cause yeah, you, know, no doubt. you gotta want, want to do the job on the other end, which is going to be even more taxing when you're done at the team doing it for real, you know? So yeah, people, I think people lose sight of that. You know, I was young and naive. I was, I always looked far ahead. I wasn't there just to say, Hey, I, I just want to see if I could complete buds. You know, I, I wanted to do the job. So I, that's what kind of carried me through. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah, the guys that quit, they, they got there and they instantly realized, no, it's not for me. You know? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. They're there. They're obviously probably there for the wrong reason. And then, I mean, legitimately probably some guys just could not hack it. I mean, that's yeah, exactly. that's hard, really hard. Fuck, it's like the hardest military training in the world, right? Yeah, I mean, some people can't hack it and they get hurt. So you get a lot, yeah. a lot of guys from injuries. Uh, and they just can't fit. Like, they thought they trained enough. They did not train enough. Or they thought they could. They were just going to get prepped in boot camp. And, you know, the couple of weeks leading up to starting first phase was going to be enough. And, yeah. you know, the guys who put in the legwork a year or more in advance for them even showing up to that point were successful. You know, so... Cause they, they just knew what it took. Would you, would you say that it's, it's more of a test of mental toughness compared to physical yeah. toughness? It's way more mentally. I think just the day in and day out kind of grind. It's, it's taxing mentally, you know, and you kind of take yeah. kind of that doubt starts creeping in your mind when you're like physically smoked, you're sleep deprived, you're hungry all the time. And then you got these, outside influences like these guys like you kind of get close with they're quitting and they're like and you look at a stud or something and he freaking quits and you're like holy shit mm -hmm. he just quit so you kind of have to battle all these kind of outside little influences but definitely more mentally yeah you're basically in a battle with yourself the entire time exactly right? yeah yeah and you're always, you always have to talk yourself into hey just fucking wake up and just got just through another going. day. It's a joke. You know, you hear all this all the time to say, hey, make it to the next meal, make it to the next meal. Mm -hmm. 
and get through the day. Yeah. I mean, at the end of the day, we're off like at 4.35, you know, like from training, but the day still continues with your class. So you're still doing ancillary duties after hours. So you're, you're still going, you're not getting enough sleep. You're not eating enough. Right. You're, you know, just shit adds up. You get weekends off, which is nice. Um, yeah. So that's, that's helps. What do you guys do on the weekends or even like, so you get off at four 30 and you're saying that you roll into like your ancillary, whatever that is. Like what time do you actually get to go back to your room, hang out? Like, what do you, I mean, obviously I would imagine you guys just probably get as much sleep as you possibly can to Dude, recover. Yeah, We weren't even in our rooms but, until about eight or so. And then we're freaking prepping our helmet, repainting our helmet, cleaning all our dive gear, cleaning our room. Cause the next day you geez. got inspection. You got, you know, so dudes ain't going to sleep until like midnight you won, but you got to wake up at four, four a.m. tomorrow. The next day, we got a time run on the beach. Everyone's got to pass. Or you're going to get rolled, you know. And then we got a, a two mile ocean swim this morning, so everyone's got to fucking pass. Or so that's like more stress too. And you have to have all your dive gear like spick and span for the inspection before you swim. Yeah, yeah. And Damn. the instructors they jack with they mess with all your gear the night before. Like they go inside <laughs> really? the dive locker. It's like I mean, I did it when I was an instructor. <laughs> Yeah. They fucking tear it up, fucking dump sunscreen all over it, sand all over it. Oh, so your your night is just screwed. <laughs> Man, that's brutal. Did you get the? Uh, I've heard stories of like guys um, because during Hell Week, the sleep deprivation, like um, what do you call like uh, you start like dreaming shit as if it's real, like it's not not real, you know? Start um, hallucinating and shit. Ha- hallucinating. Week. That's a, yeah, that's what I'm looking for. The word hallucinating. Did yeah. You, did you have that experience at all? I would say like Wednesday, I wasn't, I wasn't seeing like vivid, like dreams or anything like that, but I was falling asleep at the weirdest positions. I've never thought I could fall asleep. Just like paddling a boat, like out in the water, like on Thursday mm-hmm. night, uh, or just standing up, you know, just, you're like, you think you're awake, but you're really not. you like kind of, your mind tricks <laughs> yeah. you. Uh, that's the type of shit I remember. Um, but people have different experiences yeah. when they're sleep deprived. Yeah. People are like losing their mind and <laughs> like just acting weird, like not themselves. So, um, after hell week is done, like, and you, you guys obviously celebrate and you're done. Like what is, I've always wondered, like, what does everybody do after that? Everybody just go right to sleep. Like I would dude. Yeah. We just go, well, they what, have, what's it like? They, they have pizza and Gatorade standing by for you. <laughs> Really, and then you go, you grab a freaking box of pizza and your giant Gatorade, and then you go, and they put all the mattresses because we live in like bunk beds. They put all mm-hmm. the mattresses on the ground, and then you just go in your bedroom, and you pass out. <laughs> and then like no we got Help. like these white shirt, basically junior class below us, kind of monitoring. They go to room to room, make sure like dudes are still alive and like breathing, and uh, they would <laughs> like. <laughs> Walk up, wake you up, like, hey, what do you want to eat? Like, dude's like, go get me in and out, and they would go get us in and out. No kidding. Uh, so, how, how long do you guys? How long did you sleep after uh, after Hell Week? Basically, you got that whole weekend to recover. Okay. Like, I rented like that Saturday. Like, my dad, came, my dad came into town, and like, he rented me a room out in downtown San Diego, and I just like feasted on like room <laughs> service and like chilled out with him. That's cool. Uh, but yeah, most guys will like hang out, go home or something, or that night you have to stay there that Friday mm-hmm. night just to like, for medical reasons, make sure you don't like yeah. die. And then the following <laughs> day, if you're all good to go, then you could kind of, you could leave the base. No kidding. Yeah. I always wondered that. Like if everyone just vegged out for two or three days or yeah, whatever. People just veg out and eat all day, every day with. And you're right back at it the following week, dude. They call it the next week. They call it walk week. Basically, they let you walk everywhere. You're not doing mm-hmm. any type of physical test, swimming or running. You're just walking and doing like class stuff. So you get a full yeah, week. You, you just get a week recovery. After, yeah, at least they give you that. Yeah, so you get like Monday through Friday. You get like the walk week recovery. You call whatever you want. It's definitely not recovering anything. And then mm-hmm. the, the following week after that, now you're right back at it. Hey. You got to pass these. Now you're doing a 30 minute time run. Time just reduced on the run. Time just reduced on the swim. Hey, you got to pass. <laughs> yeah. So at what point did you roll? You said you got rolled back. Was that? Um, no, I rolled in. What uh, was that? Second phase for uh, okay. runs, running. That's why I was still running. Running with my 
man running was my kryptonite um i was like good but like during second phase like i don't know i would just was just either smoke mentally weak or something at that time or fucking just couldn't run as well so i ended up getting rolled like halfway through second phase so i passed like mm-hmm. a like kind of a milestone like um pool comp comp pool competency basically it's like a pool yeah. week they that's where you see like dudes like getting tossed into the water with the scuba tanks and tying their knots. Yeah. So that's kind of like a milestone in the second phase. So I passed that. I ended up like not passing a run. I got rolled into the falling class. So I had like a month, a little like three weeks to a month kind of buffer between the next class. Um, but I don't know, like when I came back, I came back like way stronger. My body was, I felt better. I think it was just more of the yeah. rest and I came back and I crushed every single run. So I don't know what it I mean, I look back, I just kind of laugh at myself. I'm like, Hey dude, I just had like a, a momentary lapse of mental weakness on the, on the running game or yeah. something. But yeah, that was, it, that was my kind of kryptonite and buzz was the running piece. Yeah. yeah. It's, it's pretty common. I mean, when you roll back that you don't start, obviously you don't start from the beginning. Do you, do you start back from where you left off or? Yeah. I start back in second phase again. Right where I left off. Okay, so that's cool. At least they don't just completely screw you and you're starting all over again. I mean, no, I, I I picked back up right where I left. Yeah, well, that's cool. So after, um, so you graduate buds. Uh, obviously, that's a huge accomplishment in and of itself. I mean, a lot of guys, I think, probably think you go from buds and like you're a SEAL. That's obviously not the case. As you mentioned, you have to go to SEAL qualification training. Um, and how long was that, did you say? That's about four months. So... You have to finish that, and then after you finish SEAL qualification training, is that when you guys That's get That's when pinned? you become a SEAL. Okay, and you get your trident? You get your trident then. So it's what, like a year? About a year. At least? Yeah. Yeah, from start to finish? It's a so long yeah, time. about a year, give or take. Yeah. And then, you, then you can call yourself a SEAL. They give you the trident and stuff like that after SQT. Nice. Okay. And, and that's like, they're not like eight-hour days. They're, they're long days in there yeah. too, right? And yeah, you're traveling like too. hours wise. Yeah. So you're, you're going to like, those are still long training days. I mean, you're doing, you're not getting beat down like you were in buzz. You, you get to do like regular workouts and do CrossFit. It was like a big thing back then. We always do CrossFit. Um, but you're traveling a lot. Like you're going to mm-hmm. nothing like Nyland. They call this. It's like in the salt and sea. Um, it's in California. And then, uh, mm. basically you're traveling around and do all these kind of trainings and you're gone for like three weeks at a time. So, they're long freaking days. Uh, yeah, taxi. Yeah, just training. Yeah. Do you go to, like, do they have different specialties that some people go at that point, or is it is this all just basic sealed All training basic kind sealed of thing? fundamental training that okay. everybody gets. And then ap- after that is when you would go to, like, a sniper school exactly. or CQB or whatever it is. Exactly. Mm, okay. Everyone gets to CQ, all that, like, kind of baseline CQC, uh, close quarters battle. Um, all the shooting fundamentals, the, the, the diving, all the stuff you seals are kind of known for. And then, yeah, once you fast forward, you get to the seal teams. That's when kind of like, all right, Hey Travis, what do you, what are your kind of goals? Like I want to be a, a breacher. I want to be a sniper. You know, And then you kind of get pigeonholed into that route. What, what did you end up doing? I mean, obviously you did the medic thing, but did I ended you up doing the medic too? and I'm doing Intel. Okay. Nice. So after C, uh, ask you, after I'm sorry after SQT um, you graduate that do, do you guys even drop out of that or is that like a pass or fail or yeah for the pass most or part, fail everybody moves on very rarely some guys will get like rolled they'll just get like yeah. rolled back for not passing some you still like have to pass some tests but they may not pass some like shooting tests or something get rolled or may get injured in skydiving which happens a lot that's that's kind of like the, the majority of it um, but no they don't quit. Yeah. yeah, that's yeah. I didn't that's think so. Not, not probably not when you get to that stage. Like, why at that point? Why would you? Unless you realize it's not what you exactly, want to do. Exactly. Unless you got there, like that would be pretty rare. Which there are stories that I just get to like, oh, I gotta actually shoot bad guys. Like, oh no, it's You're not like, for me. Like, <sighs> all right, you just wasted you know, all this time for yourself. I don't know what to tell you, but that that the, yeah. that stuff has happened, but that's rare. So, so rare. Yeah. So how do they determine, you said you chose to go on the, the West Coast teams, and so obviously there's West Coast, East Coast teams. Um, 
how do they dictate like where you go? Obviously, if you got to pick that, you, you obviously didn't get get where you wanted to go. So how do they choose? That's like way above my pay grade. They just do Manning. <laughs> hey, we got guys retiring, transferring the team, or going to different duties, different instructor billets or whatever. Like, hey, we need to have spots to fill. So okay. they're basically like, hey, we got X amount of spots at Team Four. Or you're going. That's I mean that's how so the Navy how- works with duty stations and people assignments. You you know you got to be lucky if you want to go to a certain spot. It has to be an opening. Yeah. How does, uh, how does tier one work? Like, uh, Deb grew and all that. Does it, so they obviously pull from the teams and they just pick whoever they want. Is that kind no, of how it works? Basically when you're at the team and you want to do that, you got to apply and then they screen you through your kind of, they do like a full blown application, oral board interview, and then, then you got to do a test out basically physical fitness test. And then if you pass all that and then you go, through their pipeline, which is nine months, I believe it's something okay. like that. So it's really, it's long. I think it's like between six and nine months. I never, I never tried out, but it's, it, I think it's close to that, that time frame. Mm-hmm. Was it something you ever wanted to do or did you ever think about doing it or? Yeah. I, oh yeah. I thought about doing it many times. I just never committed because I wasn't sure if I wanted to stay in the military for yeah. the entire 20 years. Um, but I, cause I knew I was kind of torn between that decision with my life. Because I knew if I attempted to do that and I was successful, then that's a full bore commitment. Lifestyle yeah. commitment, I would just do it for the long haul. And that's even more of a time commitment than the regular vanilla teams, I call it. So yeah, <laughs> that's even more of a commitment. So you're, you're gone even yeah. more. Yeah, I mean, it makes sense, you know, that, that high level of training. Um, <clears throat> okay, so you get put on a SEAL Team 4. Like, what's it like? Walking into the, into, um, you know, wherever your, your teams are. I mean, um, obviously you guys probably have your own base where they separate, you know, the seals or other special forces guys. Like how does that work out? Yeah. Like, I mean, where do you no, everyone's on a team. They're each building. There's like different buildings for different teams. You got team four, team two, team 10, like all the, the hmm. odd numbers or excuse me, even numbers on the East coast. So you go to my building, team four, we're all there. They're broken up into like three different troops, we call them. Um, so I was assigned to one troop, uh, Alpha Platoon. Yeah, new guy. I was, again, back to like square one again. No one gave a shit that I was a seal. I graduated buds. No one gave <laughs> Yeah. No one cares because there's like yeah, freaking warriors walking through that hallway that done twice as much as you yeah. have. So kind yeah. of back to square zero again. And then... Yeah, walk in, keep your mouth shut, ears open, um, doing new guy duties. You know, kind of check in with the older dudes at your leadership. Uh, like yeah. your, your, your thing, like, please, like your sergeant and uh, your corporal, but like, you know, you call them LPO, leading petty officer or your chief, check in with them and they kind of assign you. And you get assigned like a, we call them like C daddies, basically like a mentor. C daddy is like a joke, but that's mm-hmm. like something we, we talk shit on but yeah you get like a mentor like an older guy will, yeah. will mentor you up show you the way yeah, yeah. i'm <laughs> sure their mentoring is uh lovely as as far as the the teams go so you're on team four that doesn't mean that like when you guys deploy the entire team four deploys or, or how's that work because there's teams within the team if i i could be completely wrong so there's only one team and yes when it's up our term our excuse me our time to deploy we all deploy Okay. And we all get split to the wind. You know, one maybe like for instance, like one one troop went to like Iraq, two troops okay. went to Afghanistan, three troops went to South America. Hmm. So, okay. so you don't know where you're going. Yeah. So you keep, and then see so exactly. You don't know where you're going until it's like a month out for the time you actually have to deploy. And they'll tell yeah. you. But typically yeah. each team had its own like area of operation. Team four was known their like specialty was South America. Hmm. And you never went where you, you I went go to, to South, South America, America. I went to at Columbia. some point. Okay. Your third third deployment? Yeah, third deployment. What'd you do in like uh what was going on in Columbia? Was it like drug trade stuff or or what you... basically be like advise and assist and, and train their kind of partner force equivalent to us. Um, okay. We train them up, whatever, and everything 
shooting, CQC tactics, et cetera. And then we would mm -hmm. also advise and assist them with their, like, basically it was all counter narcotics. Uh, yeah, they they yeah. use their, like, arm, you know, military special forces as their kind of glorified police SWAT team. Is mm -hmm. in those types of countries you can't really trust the regular police. I mean, yeah. so they use these guys that are more vetted, a little more. They're highly trained. You know, they're trained by Americans um, mm -hmm. to go out and do, do business. Uh, and and we would work with like other interagents, like out of the embassy annex that was at where I was at, because um, there's a big embassy in Bogota, Colombia, but I was another part uh, mm -hmm. in Cartagena, Colombia. So we'd work with other like there's. And DEA is like all down there. So we'd kind of work with them and help train their people. So it was kind of like interagency type thing. It was, it was, I had a good time. It was a good experience, especially in that point of yeah. my career. I was older, the more yeah. wiser. Yeah. So after your, uh, would you say your first deployment was pretty, uh, pr pretty mellow or I mean, any action, any, anything um, crazy going on in your first one? Yeah, we got in some good, some really good, uh, good action. Um, first, First off, our pl platoon ever went on, he, we lost five guys. Helo crash, not oh, to the shit. enemy, but um, so that was that was a big eye opener for all of us. Um, very first, we call it a turnover out, basically with the team that was already there mm -hmm. with us. They take us out with them to kind of show us the ropes. Hey, this is how we yeah. do business. Uh, yeah, so we do that. Lose dudes, you know, to include you know the ar the army. Um, flight crew that was on board so yeah a lot of lives lost um big eye opener for us uh so it became real at that point um even though it was just an accident but and those were guys those were sorry go ahead yeah no that was it i mean even though it was an accident when I mean, it definitely got real at that point um and then going forward it kind of like took our feet out from under us definitely like because we weren't really prepared for that but yeah Basically, for the following, the rest of the deployment was good. I mean, we got, we got, we basically did a lot of direct action. Um, we weren't really like, we did a little bit of engagement with the village. Not, it's very different from my second deployment. This one was more, hey, we got this target package. We're going after this guy. We're, we're doing like full born missions. Um, helos mm -hmm. are picking us up, dropping us off at these villages, and we're going to salt all, all the way through these villages until we find who we need to find. Yeah. Um, so, that led us into some good, some some good action, um, good base attacks that happen often. Not as much as my second one, but definitely happened. Um, they would just attack us in the middle of, in the middle of the night because our, our our fob is small. I mean, it's a small yeah. little. They call it fob. Yeah. But it's small. It's in the middle of nowhere. It's surrounded. By, it's in a bowl. It's surrounded by mountains. Um, they had the tactical advantage, uh, and they would just try to attack us basically at dusk. Uh, yeah, it's, it seems like, I mean, if you guys are down in the valley or whatever, they're obviously going to have the high ground, right? I mean, so I mean, yeah, exactly. sure going to have the high ground on you. Or they shoot mortars from up and over from the village, like on the other side of the, the mountain. Mm -hmm. That is. Um, so, and they're savvy. I mean, they knew what the hell we were doing. So yeah. that would happen often. Uh, and then we would sometimes we would just go out and just kind of patrol the local villages around kind of our green zone basically kind of green zone is kind of whatever expands outside of your fob kind mm -hmm. of the green zone safe zone we always try to expand that and make it bigger um kind of push the enemy away because yeah. they're always trying to creep in they're always trying to come in and kind of influence the local populace to kind of give them intel on what we're doing how we're helping them you know etc kind of coercing them to do something so we always try to patrol out and we would get in ticks all the time just doing that yeah, and was and tell everybody what so, a tick is a troop in contact. Troop in contact, yeah, basically a firefight. Um, yeah, we would that would happen often. Basically, we'd be patrolling through a field, up in field, and the next thing you know, we would just be getting opened up on. Um, and are these how far away are they when they're when they're shooting at you guys? I mean, are can you see them? Like, do you even know where they're shooting at you from? Or how? Yeah, is, we can how see that? that. They're pretty far. I mean, looking back at my first deployment, they're pretty far. I would say like hundred yards, maybe or. Very it's like only a couple far, occasions but... it was within inside of a hundred because mm -hmm. more often than not, these guys are they're cowards. You know, they would just 
they're up in the hillside they would shoot and then they would just kind of ditch the weapon and run away um because they knew instantly we have the air superiority we, we call an air support they would see them and just take care of business but yeah they knew hey they would engage us dump the weapon and kind of stroll off like nothing happened you know because yeah. they're wearing regular clothes they look like regular civilian you know people there so they're not dressed really any different um seems like that would make it really hard if you guys are out patrolling or whatever trying to i don't know talk to the locals i mean how do you know who's how do you know who's 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 who in the zoo like who's a bad guy and who's not you just you don't yeah you really right? don't you try to build relationships with like the local elders and stuff and build rapport um yeah. and try to get them to feed you intel we i would do that a lot with like the intel side i would try to recruit guys to and pay them to come hey give yeah. me some intel come meet me you know etc uh and just kind of understand who's who in the zoo and mm-hmm. who's who's coming in who's coming out and we would get a lot of good good people like that but that that was our biggest influence was that but we really wouldn't know because as soon as we leave you know the taliban would come right in and be like hey what the hell did you just talk about because we'll just kill your family yeah. or whatever you know they have more more of the upper hand yeah that that seems really risky for them to be doing that so i mean i don't know how much info they would give you guys but or how accurate it was but so um when you guys lost your five guys in that in that crash i mean <clears throat> You're, you're like fresh there in war, right? I mean, that's your first real world experience and you lose five guys and they're all in your, from your platoon, right? Yep. So you knew so every we had single all, one of them. And then we had lost the one guy that was not, it was a part of still team um, three. Mm-hmm. So lost his life because he was part of that air crew, like a turnover. Basically, he was like the liaison with the guys that were going with him. Um, the most experienced still team three guy. They would have like each yeah. element would have like a, a guy that's already been in country for a decent amount with the, the prior team to show them yeah. ropes, show them what's going on. Yeah. But yeah, that was real what world. I mean, that was fucking eye opener for definitely for me, but all, all of us. Yeah. How old are you? Like 20, yeah, 23, 22 at the time. Man, you're like, I'm here. This is it. I'm a Navy SEAL. This is it. I'm in war. And then a bunch of your buddies get killed right yeah. when you get there like that. That that would be pretty gut wrenching to me. Yeah, and most of and all of Mentally. us was our. I wouldn't say all. There was like one or two guys that went to Iraq before this, and the rest of us, like ninety percent of the platoon, were brand new guys. <laughs> we never had no experience dude. downrange, like doing reward shit. So it was definitely like that's crazy. Over, but we learned a lot from it, and we were able to kind of rally up and what do you... take care of business. It. Go ahead, did you have a question? Is there like a, so after something like that happens, is there like a downtime where they give you the process, you know, what happened and everything? Or is it like, okay, well, we still got a job to do. Let's go do our job and do what we got to do. Yeah, I think we had, we had like a couple of days. And then the chief was like, hey, it's time to go. It wasn't good yeah. just to sit around. We could have sit around and sulk yeah. all day. And right. Fucking nothing. But yeah, there was a few days. They let us, you know, kind of get our wits about us and be like, all right, let's, let's fucking get back to work boys. And everyone was yeah. fired the fuck up to do it. Cause they're all pissed off and fucking yeah. hungry and ready to go. Well, and you're doing it for your, for your guys that just, just lost their lives. I mean, that sucks, man. Um, yeah, I think there's definitely something to be said about that. Cause you know, in, in law enforcement, yeah. there's a lot of times where, where people just, you know, sit there and you know traumatic things have happened in law enforcement probably to all of us but um you know then they just want to sit there and oh rebuild or whatever and you know you have your time off whatever some people some people that's great i think and it helps them out a ton for other people i think it's like hey i'm I'm sitting here and just in my own thoughts and whatever like let me get after it let me let me do what i got to do yeah i i uh one, one of the um nothing obviously compared to, to that but like a good from what you just said, I mean, a good story, something that really stuck with me until this day, actually. Um, Billy had a guy at his department got shot and killed on a call. And this was like a long drawn out thing where like, I think four other cops ended up getting shot too. And, you know, he ends up getting killed and, and, you know, I'm there with a bunch of other cops cause I was a dog handler and we were training nearby. And so we got there relatively quickly after it happened. But um, I do remember like, that was like a, that was like really eye opening, right? As a cop, you know, like 
here's another officer that just got killed. Four four other other cops were shot. Um, pretty pretty traumatic deal. And I remember we we're all standing in a circle, trying to you know we still had a job to do of like clear this whole hotel, which is like a three or four story hotel. It was huge, and we're all rallied up. A bunch of SWAT teams are there, and obviously people are down. They're crying and stuff because their buddy just died. And I remember this captain shows up and I don't even know who this guy was works with you guys. And he shows up and rallies everybody together. And he's just like, um, Hey, I understand everybody's upset right now, but he's like, we have a fucking job to do. We're not done doing it yet. And so we need to lift our heads up and you know, we'll remember him later, but right now we still have a job to do and we need to go and, and finish it. So, um, I, I don't know. Like, I just remember that like really like stuck with me. Um, and I, it like totally changed the atmosphere of everybody in that circle and everybody like snapped to it. And it was like, okay, yeah, there's still a job to be done here. Um, uh, we'll grieve later. Um, and, uh, I don't know, man, I just thought it was really cool for him to show up. He, this guy just like shows up out of nowhere. He wasn't even there for the whole thing. He just shows up in a vehicle and rallied everybody together real quick and boom, like motivated everybody instantly. Yeah. Um, that's pretty that's Dude, powerful. To this day, that people, it was like you said, they, they all they, that's, this need something like that. Outsider coming in, hey, give us some perspective in that moment, and you know, fucking so get that. I thought it was right. really cool. Yeah, especially because like, you know, I, I I truly think that most cops think like, oh, we're, we're not, I'm not going to die, or I'm not going to get shot and killed, or whatever at work, and then it happens in your own backyard, and it's like pretty traumatizing, you know? So I, I can only imagine that's like, I can only imagine what you guys are going through when you just lose five dudes. They're all your friends. You're like just fresh into war. You know, you're getting in gunfights. You're 20, 22 years old or 23 years old. Dude, that's like for someone of that age to even have to experience that. That's to me, that's just crazy. Um, it's, I mean, I don't know if, you know, I'm, I'm sure you think of it like that, but it's like, you're a police officer now, right? Like think of some young, cop coming out of the academy who's 20, 21 years old um you know and they're getting forced out into society where you know it's it's it can be rough out there depending on especially depending on where you work but it's like you can f- find yourself in a gunfight on day one i i think it's like you you brought up like you know we we as cops and i'm sure seal operators are are somewhat the same or maybe even more extreme as you go out there and, you know like you said not thinking that you're gonna be in a battle not thinking you're gonna get shot or or something like that you kind of have to have that though because if if i went out there every day saying if i do this I'm, i might get shot i wouldn't i wouldn't fucking do it like straight up it's for what for what we do you know for what navy seals do is a little bit different but for what law enforcement does at some point you're like at what cost, you know? Um, so you kind of sit there and you, you choke it down and you go, Hey, this is, you know, it's, we all know it's a possibility, but you think it'll never happen to you. And, and I think that's self-preservation for some. I agree. I mean, yeah, it would be even looking back even now it, for guys like us, it would, it would just be crippling. If we always worried about what was going to happen to us every single day, I'd be ineffective at my job. And I think that's, the type of person, then you think about the type of person that does these types of jobs, who they are, you know, they're, they're master of their emotions. They're, you know, they, they want to face adversity. They can handle problems. They, you know, they're not constantly like that scared mentality. Cause if we were, mm-hmm. we wouldn't get anything done in my opinion. Yeah. I think we would just be basically yeah, combat no. ineffective at that point. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I agree. So, I mean, obviously you guys all rallied with each other and, and finished doing what you needed to do. How you were there for what? 10 months. You said your first, no, that appointment? one I was there for about seven. Okay. And then, uh, the second one I was there for a lot, a little bit longer, like eight. And describe to us, what was your second deployment? Like now that you're kind of like, I mean, you're tested now at that point, you got some salt. Yeah. I had yeah. Some salt, you're, not you the, know. you're not the new guy. <laughs> I had some salt on my sea bag. You know, I was like, yeah. yeah a veteran. I was, I wasn't a new guy at that point. Um, yeah. but yeah, going in the second time I felt more comfortable cause I've already been there and I was going in basically the same region I was already at, like actually not very far from where I was before same Valley and same uh, province. So we kind of knew, but the mission set was different at the time. The second deployment, they were pushing this whole thing called VSO village stability operations. Basically you just kind of embed you know, working really diligently with the partner force, 
the Afghan National Security Force, and then working with the locals of the village that you live nearby. Um, basically heavily involved in what's going on there and building that r relationship and that rapport for long-term relationships. That's where we ended up being there for longer because the whole mission was, hey, we need to have guys there for like 10, 11 months. Mm -hmm. So the team two, the guys that we relieved, like they were there for like 10 months, 10, 11 months, pushing a year. Uh, so when we showed up, those dudes were uh, real salty. But we relieved them and that whole mission was, yeah, you're kind of, you're more concerned about your sphere of influence within like the valley that we lived in and operated in. So we're always doing projects, you know, helping out building stuff, schools, bridges, et cetera, um, employing kind of local people. And then we would push out to other villages, like I said, mentioned before, to kind of increase that green, green zone um, and kind of just hold down that valley and just own it. Um, unlike the first one, we never really did too many kind of flyaways to like other provinces, other valleys, like far away. Uh, we did that a lot in my first deployment. This one, we basically just patrolled everywhere. We couldn't drive. I mean, you, you could only get to where we were by helicopter for one. They can't bring us food. They had to airdrop us food. I mean, it was a tiny hundred yard kind of by hundred yard little fob. Like I could throw a football on the other side. It was really small. Um, much more, much different experience than my first one. First one, living a little better quality of life, a little bigger fob. We had huts, beds, kind of working toilets and showers. This one, we'd have, I didn't shower, none of us showered for like four and a half months. Uh, we we're living off mostly like the, the local food. We didn't have toilets. Um, we never had running water, never had toilets. We had like a kitchen made out of dirt. It was just like something the team, the team prior, they kind of just acquired this and built it on their own. And we kind of just improved it throughout our time there. Um, but it, with that mission, we were every day getting into something. I mean, we would get into a firefight damn near every single day. We would get our base would get attacked damn near every single night. We would just joke and call it like tick 30, basically like 730 at night. They would just attack us every time right at dusk. But and every time we went out, we would get into something. Um, we were just more in it where we were. We're kind of just left out to ourselves. We didn't have too many assets. Not Helicopters didn't like coming to, in there because it was like really deep into a bowl. Um, they would always get fired upon. So they're always so hesitant to come in. Um, so a lot, lot more rule. But to me, it was much, it was a lot funner and I, a lot better experiences that second go around um, than my first. Just basically, just because with the experience, I was older SEAL now. I had more responsibility. I kind of knew what the hell I was doing. Um, so it, it was fun. I mean, really in those types of environments, it sounds super shitty, but at the same time, you get to be like, I did that. Like I, I was in the rough of the rough. Um, you know, you get to claim that right. You know, that's yeah. pretty tough living. I mean, you're getting firefights every day. And how long were you guys there? Yeah, we're there months, for 11 months, eight months. Yeah, dude, so. that's, that's a lot of action. I mean, that's a lot of gunfights. I mean, not, not everybody's going to get to say that. Yeah. So it, this, where we're at in general, I just feel like they, the, the Taliban were just really frivolous on, they didn't care. I mean, they weren't, <laughs> even, these guys sweat, they weren't even sweating it. I mean, we would, they would shoot at us with small arms and they would, basically idea indirect fire mortars at us a lot and mm -hmm. it kind of like ebbed and flowed when we first got there it was like happening all the time then like winter hit then it would happen like every so often uh and then kind of the winter went away and then they're back at it again because they you know when the winter comes um we were there kind of like in the middle and of summer winter and then kind of after summer but because mm -hmm. winter time they're notorious for kind of laying low but I think just our location in general was we were just so involved that they kind of had no choice. And we were always kind of, we were always working, man. We had our chief and our leadership were, were, were badass. Like I looked up to those dudes and they were just hard chargers. Even my first deployment, they were the same, same chief. Um, my first deployment and then the second one, uh, just studs. And they were just like, Hey, we're going, we're going, we're going. They worked us a lot, but 
we got things done, which which was yeah. nice. Yeah, that's that's badass. I mean, where are these guys living at? I mean, did you guys not know like where they're where they're staying? I mean, where like obviously they're appearing from somewhere. Yeah, they would just come from like the north. They wouldn't live where we would could get to. Um, we were yeah. basically patrolling into like the village, like kind of north or south of us, and they would just come in. They would they would get mm. word that we're coming, and they would just open up on us. That's wild. Yeah, or they, we would hear them all over the radio. Or they call them yeah. ICOMs. Uh, the Motorola's. They would just our interpreters, our partner for us, would be like, "Oh, we hear them talking. They're talk. They're talk. Hey, we're coming. Americans are coming this way. They would just interpret us and let us know what they're what they're talking about, and they know yeah. they know when we're coming." Yeah, that's crazy. At, at a certain point, when you're when you're in when you're in this shit like every single day, like you're saying, does complacency sit in, set in a little bit where you're like, oh, you know, just another this, another that, whatever. Definitely. Where I mean, you're in a hardcore battle pretty much every day where you're like, it's just normal. I think it does, and it does when you got those uh, lull times when shit kind of relaxes, and you and towards the end that. that of the deployment is where like complacency kills, you know, like, Hey, well, we've been here. We know what the fuck's going on. And just, we kind of have that, that wrap off. We're not overly stressed. So those are like the two yeah. most critical moments is like in the very beginning of your deployment at the very end are like the most dangerous yeah. because you just, in the front end, you kind of don't know what the hell you're doing. And then at the back end, you're complacent, you know, you're, Mm -hmm. I've been here, done that. I know what the hell's going on. And next thing you know, something happens. So yeah, it's kind of like, kind of like what we all do now for a living, you know, being cops, it's same thing. A lot of guys get killed at the end of their career because it's like, Oh, I put in 20 some years or 30 years. I'm, I'm good. And then wham, dude, they get killed. Yeah. You just like, Hey, this is just a regular shift or whatever, like regular beat. And then all it takes is one bad person, bad day. And he wants to kill you. You know, you just, yeah. 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 So, dude, that's that's pretty crazy. Like, I mean, that's that's a lot of action in your second deployment. Um, did you guys lose anybody or any any? We personally get... did not lose anybody. My sister platoon lost a guy. Uh, we lost two guys that deployment, and not not I wasn't they weren't part of my platoon in my area where I was at, but they were in country in a different location. Um, both were killed um, by the enemy. That's got to be tough too. I mean, when you guys hear that, even if they're in a different, <clears throat> different location than you guys, just hearing that is like, it, it like becomes real to me at that point when you're hearing guys are of that caliber are still losing their lives to some coward. Oh yeah. You know, it's, it, it, like that's got to set in like, shit, this, we are not invisible. I don't care how badass you are. Like you're not invisible. hundred percent. Nobody and, is. And you know, and you're like close with the dudes too. You know, them. I mean, they're in the same truth. Yeah. They're not like somebody you don't know. So uh yeah. yeah it's tough no matter where it is but typically it's yeah, like that's... they die like the first you know, one, one of the guys was hey they're on their way home we're patrolling <laughs> out we're getting out of here and next thing you know enemy opens up hits some lucky shot in the back you know oh, so it's like God. things like that where it's like you're pissed yeah, yeah. you know he didn't go out the way he wanted he probably would rather face to face with the enemy going to a gunfight than go out but yeah, you, know, you hear those stories and you're like, shit, you know, like horrible, wrong place, wrong time. Yeah. How, how did you deal with it? Cause I mean, uh, personally I've, I've, I had a fairly good friend that was, was killed in law enforcement and you know, it's, it's not easy. I, I if anyone says that it didn't affect them and it will not affect them for the rest of their life, they're, they're lying, I think. Um, but you know, how, how do you get over that? How do you, how did you work through those issues? I think in the moment when I was there, I was too, I was upset. I was, ang I was more angry uh, and frustrated, but I was more distracted than anything just because where I was at in the moment um, on yeah. the deployment, because I, I knew I just couldn't dwell on this because mm -hmm. it was, a, it would affect me, you know, inevitably affect me in my job. But I think after the fact, when I got home, things calmed down, you know, you're kind of more stateside, you have time to think about it. You know, it's, it's hard, you know? I try to just, me personally, I try not to dwell on because I've lost quite a few friends, you know, not just from being killed, but, you know, suicide or training accidents. Um, yeah, I try to remember the good things about them. It's it's still tough no matter, like you said, I don't care who you are, it's going to be tough, especially if you know, yeah, yeah. if it's a friend, 
uh, it's going to be tough. So I try to just remember the good things about him and yeah. try not to, to focus in on, you know, he's gone, he's gone. Uh, that's when it becomes tough. Yeah, and, and I think fortunately in law enforcement, we we don't have as much as you have, which is which is awesome, and I hope that it never happens again. But the the sad fact is, is for those out there in law enforcement and stuff, there's a high likelihood that if it's not, you know, there's going to be someone that you know or someone close to you that uh, this could happen to, and and it, you know, think about it. I think you got to think about it and know. You prepare yourself before you got to prepare yourself for it is, is kind of what I tell people. Yep. Yeah. Always have that in the back of your mind. I agree. Cause you just never know. You never know when it's yeah. going to happen. So, you know, yeah. like you said, you got to be mentally prepared because it comes with the territory. And, and I think obviously, you know, seal team guys obviously have a upper hand on it because, you know, if you weren't mentally tough, you didn't make it through buds and you know, it's mental toughness. That's what it comes down to. And, um, you know, you gotta, you gotta fight the fight still when it's over it, it ain't over. You, you know, you gotta keep going. Yeah. I think one of the best sayings is like, uh, you know, you can, cannot prevent yourself from being victimized, but you don't have to be a victim. Yeah. You know, um, and, and it's easier said than done, but, and like you said, it is mental prep preparation and mental toughness, but, uh, you know, anytime you lose a friend, I mean, really, it doesn't matter how mentally tough you are. Like that's, gut wrenching. Um, you know, I was talking on the phone last night and told you I had a buddy that, that died recently. Um, you know, that's tough. So it's hard to get over. And I don't think you, you get over like I, like people no. use that and like I've used it. I'll get over it. I got it. You know, I'm getting over it or whatever. You, you never get over it. You just, you deal, deal with, with it better. Yeah. You're more efficient with how you yeah. deal with it for sure. Yeah. Yeah. And, and there's, there's wrong ways that I've, I've done wrong ways of getting over it or dealing with it. And there's, there's good ways. And I think that I've developed into b- better ways. So, mm-hmm. you know, you know, there's lessons out there to be learned. And, uh, the good thing is, is in law enforcement and I'm sure in the military, there's, there's plenty of people you can reach out to who will, uh, either been through it or know about yeah, it. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Well, at your level, I mean that you guys forge a serious brotherhood with each other. I'm, I'm sure like. I don't even need to ask you. I already know like that. That is like a serious bond that like cannot be broken. Yeah. Um, I think at just level. being in that environment, you know, like they always preach team teammate self, you know, I mean, I, I've talked about that too. Like that even in buds, like that's where you're groomed to be is that's your, that's mm-hmm. the way, that's the way you think, you know, it's team first, then your teammate, then you worry about yourself. You know, that's yeah. to me in that type of environment, our environment, working with partners, teammates, like, it has to be that way. Uh-huh. Yeah. Uh, it instills great leadership too. I mean, transitioning into life. I mean, just outside of the teams or whatever, like that is phenomenal leadership lessons um, learned the hard way, but can't ask for anything better than that. Yeah, and you can exactly like you said, you can apply it to any, any aspect, any business, any line of work that you do. Yeah. You know, it doesn't have to be military, it doesn't have to be law enforcement, you know, just your organization, yeah. your employees, then yourself. You know, so there's something yeah. simple like that, you know, that I think it goes a long way. Yeah. Leadership is leadership, no matter what the job is. I mean, there's a way to apply it, but, um, so, um, after that second deployment, um, shit ton of action, obviously you guys come back. Um, is there downtime like between your, like, what are you guys doing it? You know, when you come back, like is, you get some time off or how does that work? Yeah. We typically come back. We do like a little, R and R rest and recovery, like in another state. We did it like in Oceanside, Maryland. Um, and then we take a little week off, like a weekend there to decompress. And then we get to, then they let us go home, um, mm-hmm. to see our family. And then we'll get like three weeks off to chill out. Yeah. So go ahead. I was just saying that, that like, I never knew about that, but that that's also very important. I think for the, the team atmosphere and everything you guys coming back and it, it's as a team, right. Going to Oceanside and, you know, it's not military base. It's no, we go to hotels. Doing whatever you guys are going to do. Yeah. Probably drinking yeah, some go, drinks. Yeah, exactly. And having to a good go out time. with each other and kind of just let loose a little bit. And we, you, you go see like a couple doctors throughout that weekend, uh, make sure everything's, you know, good to go and let it out. And that way you kind of get a little assimilated to like normal society a little bit again. Uh, then go back to, to your wife and children, your family. 
So when you go back home, like what is it? Like obviously your dad was a big influence for you, right? Going into the SEAL teams. I mean, he's the one that kind of showed you the brochures to get into the SEAL teams. He introduced you to it. So like now that you're doing it, you've got a couple of deployments on your belt. You've got all that combat experience and you're going back home. I mean, are those conversations being had between you and your dad of like, Hey, what, like, what'd you do? Or to be honest with you, I mean, what's, what's that like? No, I mean, I never had like now, I think now I do more with that with him. But while I was in looking back, like when I came home, it wasn't like, tell me what you, he never asked like, tell me what you did over there. What exactly did you do? Like, mm-hmm. It was more, very, very more you know, vague. It was like, how was it? You know, mm-hmm. everyone okay? Like, do you feel all right? And the, the, the questions weren't really specific and we didn't really dive deep into that. And I kind of preferred it that way at the time. Like I didn't, I never really told my mother like really what I was doing. I had a hard time even telling them like where I was going. Um, my mm-hmm. dad, I was told he was super comfortable with it. Um, my parents were kind of iffy in the beginning with military in general, but as soon as mm-hmm. I became a SEAL, they were kind of a little bit at ease, but then kind of a little stressed out because of what was going on at the time with, uh, with combat. But mm-hmm. yeah, yeah, it, it wasn't really in-depth conversations about like what, what missions you go on, like how many yeah. did you get a firefight and shit like that. It was yeah. not, not at all. Yeah. Do you think that was done on purpose on their behalf or they just didn't yeah. know or? I don't know. I think or, they may have wanted a little to, know, naive to, but I think they were probably just afraid to ask. Yeah. Uh, yeah. To believe, to, to be honest, probably just afraid to ask me. Um, and I don't know how I would have responded. Pro- I probably wouldn't have, I probably would have just yeah. kept it vague. I wouldn't have really gave them the, the nuts and bolts and dirty details about it, but yeah, they never really did. Yeah. How old were you after your second deployment? I was probably like what? 25. Yeah, 25, 26. Yeah, still pretty young. Yeah, still fairly, really young. Yeah. Man, you ever sit there and just think back, like, from 20 years old or whenever you got in at 18, I guess, to, you know, 25, which is only a five-year gap, you just experienced more than 99% of anybody in the world. <laughs> like, that's – you ever sit there and just think about that? Yeah. Like, that's just crazy. I have a few times. You know? Yeah, it's like it's hard to imagine. I don't know any other way though. Um, yeah, but I didn't really kind of understand until like I, I'm out, being out now is really kind of yeah. now I find myself really like dwelling on it, thinking back, and being like inundated with you know regular society, you know, for lack mm-hmm. of better words, like going to college again, you know, doing the graduate school, being involved, like actually going to the school and just being around regular people. It just, yeah, it's, it's definitely, you think back like, holy shit. Yeah. You know, I've definitely yeah. done a little something. Like, but So I, that, that made me think of something and I don't know if you want to talk about it or, or not or whatever, but we've all been to a police Academy and, um, you know, with everything you went through and then you, you go to a police Academy and you, you see these people, in academies and, and whatnot complaining and acting yeah. like it's the worst thing on the fucking planet. And how, how do you deal with that? Probably looking at them sideways. Like, what? cause I mean, like I remember, you know, I obviously didn't have the military background buds, all that and everything, but you know, I did construction for 10 years and it's, you know, it, people yelled at me every day. My bosses yelled at me every day. And it, it's like that you get to the Academy and the first day they're like, you suck or whatever they want to say. And you're like, oh, okay. Yeah, this is, this is what we're going through. You got to go check the boxes, yell at me times. And then you see people breaking down from them. And you're like, man, you got to step out right now, man. This ain't for you. Yeah. 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 It was, it was tough. I'm like a mellow dude in general, pretty laid back. You know, I like to think, but yeah, it was like that part of me was a struggle. Like I almost, lost it on a few people pretty damn close just because like i don't like complainers like i that's like even yeah. in the teams like i hated that when people complain about the how we're living or what we're doing it's just like i can't stand it but back to your point yeah when i was going through the training that was kind of a hard pill to swallow but i just need to understand with the type of people i was around i was around really young people i mean i was like one of the oldest dudes in there in my 30s yeah. Yeah. So everyone else was 20. We had a 20 year old that just turned 21 and like all, you know, young twenties. That was me. So yeah, that, that was me, you know, my career. But there was 
totally opposite ends of the spectrum though. We had some studs, you know, then we got some people that just like, they showed up there for all the wrong reasons. I had no idea what the hell they were doing. So it, right. it, it frustrates you just like anywhere else, any type of selection process. Um, for me though, when I was there, I, I knew for one, they already knew who I was, my background. They did mm-hmm. instantly. I knew they were going to try to test me. I played the game. I've been an instructor. I know, I know what the deal is. They were trying yeah. to test me, but I just mainly, my point was just from even looking back the rest of my prior career, like I needed to be like the example for the military general and like the seal coming in here, because I know they're going to mm-hmm. see if I was some you know, prick attitude, arrogant, um, which they did. They tried to test me on that, but I knew that was, gonna, I was going to be under a microscope and I just need to kind of betray and be kind of a, the older leader of the class. But it was hard to deal with those young, young people at times, but I managed. Mm-hmm. <laughs> well, yeah, before- and you got to just swallow it is, you know, I, I think, I think we all dealt with that at some, at some point in our careers of whatever they were in our careers and you just swallow and say, okay, yeah, it is what it is. But I, yeah. I can imagine with your background, it being a little bit more like, you're really going to complain about this motherfucker. Yeah. <laughs> That's, I mean, I would tell them too. I would put them in perspective. Like, hey, dude, this is the same bad man. I'd be like, this is gonna be easy yeah. compared to what you're about to do, especially nowadays with policing. So, I mean, yeah, I try to give perspective to people, but again, there was just some people I just, I just know they weren't gonna make it and didn't make it, so I didn't really put time into them. But yeah, um, before we get too far into the, we'll, we'll get into the law enforcement section here in a minute. Sorry, but, um, I went out of turn. Yeah, you, he always goes, he always goes, throws everything out of whack. Sorry, I mean. Uh, I was interested about something that got brought up. No. So, um, you, you had mentioned that you became a, a, a buzz instructor and, you know, just from listening to other seals and, and guys that have done that or gone that route, um, the general consensus seems to be like, it wasn't something they really wanted to do. And for whatever reason, they, they got put in that position. And then at the end of it, it was like the most rewarding thing they've ever done. Um, I mean, Oh yeah. Is that the, for, how was that for you? And what was it like being an instructor there versus a student? The, probably the greatest two years, one of the greatest two years of my military career, hands down. Uh, really? Because like you said, I, for me, that's where I kind of grew, like not only as like a man, like in maturity wise, um, but, you know, as a professional, as a SEAL, as an instructor, you know, like I learned those type of leadership skills there. Um, cause I knew, again, when you're there, you, you are the example, you, you are mm-hmm. the epitome of what these people are wanting or striving for. So you're like on a pedestal there, but not only that, like that was rewarding and being an instructor, I, I was an instructor for first phase. So I just did all the, the physical and this mental punishment for these dudes. Yeah. You know, I, I, at the back end of it, I taught some things like. Uh, OTB like over the beach operations um, because you get you get touched you get to do a little bit of that in first phase but I taught that in the back end but yeah in the beginning you're just you're part of the selection process and just hammering hammering the guys throughout the training but I loved it I love being at the forefront basically of the training helping select the right dudes for you know who need, who deserve to be there because there's a lot of different a lot of people mm-hmm. who did not and they were there for all the wrong reasons. And that's why, like, when we first started talking about this, that's when I really knew people were there for the wrong reasons because I would, we would interview these people, interview these guys and be like, and while you're here, they would just give us these lame ass excuses. Um, mm-hmm. that were just like, okay, it makes sense you're quitting. You know, it makes sense you just quit like day two. But not only that, like on the beach every day, best shape of my life, you know, I and around the great dudes, like I was, I was around like by phenomenal dudes that I learned, like they had way more experience than me that I learned from, you know, and they took me under their wing and taught me like all, like we had like a mixed bag. We had a lot of West coast guys. We had a, a few, um, SEAL team six guys, dev group dudes with that experience. And then you got like me, a couple of East coast dudes there that get lucky enough to kind of go there because typically they don't they don't like to send guys across country because it just costs a lot maybe you know costs money <laughs> so yeah i was fortunate enough to get the gig i was fortunate enough to get first phase get selected for that because not every 
guy gets to, to gets to go there. I called and had an interview for it, and they they said, "Yeah, you're a good fit." So, yeah, it cool. was fun, dude. It was I I really enjoyed it. Um, yeah, great two years. I I think when you become the instructor after you know, um, I don't know. I think there's so much value in that and learning. Um, just. And I'm sure there's obviously pitfalls along the way and you screw up or whatever um, as an instructor. But when you see the folks that you're instructing and they look at you like, like you're God, basically, right. I would imagine um, in a guy in your shoes, man, that holds a lot of weight and you know, you sh- it should hum- humble people a little bit, but as far, but yeah, I mean, man, that really shapes people into great mentors, leadership, um, all of that. I mean, that that's a really, to me, that'd be like a really honorable thing to do to take an ordinary guy and transform him into an extraordinary person. I mean, that's pretty cool. Not everybody gets to say oh. they do that. Well, teaching and instructing is, is leadership. I yeah. Mean, it, it's, I mean, it's I the love basis it. of it. Yeah. I mean, you're obviously doing it now with your business, but I mean, you know, and, and I love doing it. I love going around and using my own experiences and teaching people that don't have that experience um, you know, and knowing that people value what you have to bring to the table, you know, I think that's really cool. And, and being a buds instructor, I mean, you're training, you're getting to select like the cream of the crop, like who's going to be the future of what you were or what you are. Yeah, and that's kind of like where I um, like the passion for being an instructor, a mentor. And because you, you can see that you see the development firsthand. Um, yeah. And like, and you're a part of that. Exactly. And you're, you're on the forefront of that, the gatekeeper, you know, sort of speak for the, for the community, especially in that phase. So we, we strive to get the right dudes through the program, you know, Hey, maybe the right dude, he's struggling, but we're going to, you know, help him along the way or whatever the case may be, or get rid of guys that just flat out just don't belong there. Cause that happens. Yeah. You know, if we instructors come together, you don't, you don't belong, you don't belong. You're gone. So it's just, that's the harsh reality because not everyone can do the job do certain jobs. So and you, yeah. and that that's necessary to be successful. But did, did the instructors ever come together and they're like, you guys were like, I don't like Billy. That guy just pissed. He looks at me. He looks at me sideways, like, and then just downhill from there for Billy. Like, <laughs> oh yeah. I'm sure. That happens, dude. All the time, dude. Just We'd be like, pick on someone. Pool evolutions. Like we're in the pool, like the students, like doing life saving, like the life saving, training evolution and like the pool instructor would like point to the guy and like, give him like the whole baseball like hey wipe the thumb the nose oh really hey get rid of this dude you know <laughs> oh, make him man, quit that's ruthless that's <laughs> brutal yeah but and if he doesn't quit then you're like all right he's a bad yeah exactly if he doesn't quit hey we were wrong if i can continue on dude but yeah and how often do you think you were wrong <clears throat> not very often yeah probably not <laughs> you yeah. could tell i mean when you're there that long you're there a certain amount of time like some guys were so good at like, they would just look at a dude and be like, I'm not going to make it. I mean, they That's could just crazy. tell right away, not even seeing them perform, just looking at them. More often than not, they'd be correct. That he, yeah. they they probably be told them that too, huh? But <laughs> probably told them like, Hey, you're not going to make it you should <laughs> yeah. do it right now. Yeah. But, and, and then you're, and then in that, that career, like you can openly say stuff like that. Like now, like doing what, what we all do. Could you imagine if you said oh, that to like a trainee or something? You'd be fired. Oh man, you'd be, <laughs> yeah, you'd be in so much trouble. I don't know if you, I don't know if they even do it now. I don't even, I don't know. I've been an instructor since uh, 2015. So shit's changed. A lot uh, of shit's changed since then. So we are yeah. like, things were changing how we we're kind of convinced even when I was there. So it wasn't like when I was going through the reins were real loose. You know, gradually over time, the reins start getting tighter because shit happens and people get offended, et cetera. So I don't know do, how it is do you now. Think that, do you think that it needed change? Like, <laughs> Definitely honestly, not. Not to set you up, yeah. yeah. No, I agree. Like, not that I've been through it or anything, but, uh, you know, that's a that's a tough position of tough people putting tough jobs where they're going to have to do some tough shit, and you better be fucking tough. And if you can't handle someone – saying something to you or yeah. doing something to you then it then then there's no fucking place for you in it i yeah. i just i mean law enforcement's a little bit different actually it's quite a bit different but you know there's still like the kid gloves that that we have to have in law enforcement are a little more understandable but in the seal teams that that's ridiculous to me yeah 
Yeah. That level of stress needs to be there. And we'll, we'll touch on that in the academy too, because that was like a big thing, especially in California. But uh, yeah. Yeah, that has to, that has to be there. Has to. So Travis, overall, um, we're going to get into law enforcement here in just a second, but overall, would you say that in your SEAL career, you feel like you accomplished what you wanted to accomplish? Are you, were you satisfied when you were done? Um, like you, you were satisfied with your career as, as a SEAL. I, yeah, I was. I think by the time I left where I was at and then knowing where I was going to go to, mm-hmm. um, I was satisfied at that point. I was like, you know what? I'm happy with what I accomplished. Um, you know, at, especially at that time in my career, I was like either stay where I'm at, do this, basically go back and do the same thing. Um, but I was satisfied. I was uh, happy and, and fulfilled. Um, but I was ready for like a lifestyle change. So that, that was and what I was. Ch- at the end of your career, like you guys choose like, okay, I'm done. Um, is it a contract thing? Is it's it a contract thing? When you d- so I, I okay, so fulfill my enlistment contract, yeah. and you just write it out and don't reenlist. And hey, when when it's your date up, you're out. Okay, and what? Real quick, like what? What was a driving factor for you to be like? I don't want to reenlist. I'm satisfied with what I've done, and I want to move on and do something different. That's got to be pretty tough going from being a damn Navy SEAL to all right, I'm going to jump into the civilian world. And in all reality, like now it's kind of like, well, I'm just an ordinary dude now. Yeah. It, I mean, what, what was the driving factor for that? For me, it was the lifestyle change. Like I wanted to just have some, I wanted to be not traveling as much. And, you know, like I was getting older, like I want to have a family eventually and just have some sense of normalcy. You know, I don't want completely just boring life, but I kind of just wanted to be in one place and be closer to family. Um, Mm -hmm. so overall, I think it was just the lifestyle. I liked it, you know, looking back, I don't regret any of it. Um, but as I got older, I got a little bit more wiser and I was like, okay, where am I, where do I see myself in in this career? You know, another 10 years or so from now. And I guess at the time it just didn't really motivate me. It wasn't like, I want to be there, you know? So I wanted to do something else. Especially when I was like, and I was 30 years old. I was, yeah, 30 years old. And at the time I was like, I did ten, like a 10 year mark. So it's either now, get out now or don't get out because it's kind of a tipping point. Yeah. Did, uh, did becoming an instructor make it easier, an easier transition into the civilian world? Yeah. Yeah. The skill sets I learned there, definitely just like, when I was there, like we went to like tons of like public speaking schools and just dealing with like other people. Um, and then my third deployment definitely helped me too, just working with other professionals, interagencies, yeah. state department, people, you know, who have no idea what the hell military people do. So just dealing with them. So definitely set me up for success. Yeah. Um, and then when I made chief and I started running the, that training cell at the last two years of my career, the special operations urban combat really I was kind of forced into stepping up into that leadership position because the chief that was there before me, he went off and did something else. Like he, I think he went to go do the um, SEAL team six. And I was, I basically was there. Hey, Travis, you need to stand up, you know, step up to the plate um, and get the job done. And I no idea what I was doing. I would just showed up there like, Hey, I have no idea. And then, hey, take it over. So I, definitely learned a lot, like a lot of professional development at that time in my career. I think that's really cool that you got to, that you got to do that, like finishing out in your career. I mean, to me, that's, yeah, that's awesome. That is awesome. Um, all right, well, let's, uh, let's take a quick break. And when we come back, we'll discuss, uh, how Kennedy defensive solutions came about and then you're transitioning into law enforcement and then we'll wrap it up after that. Sound good. Yeah. All right. All right, guys, we're back, uh, back here with Travis Kennedy. Um, so Travis, we covered your, 
your military, um, being a SEAL, sounds like you wrapped up your career, um, you know, completely happy and fulfilled with the, uh, with what you did. So, um, as which, well as you should have, I absolutely mean, from what you did. Yeah, man. You know, I, and, and honestly from, from me and, and I know Billy will say the same thing. Like, you know, thank you for everything that you've done in your career. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> that's, that's pretty amazing that, uh, you get to, you get to do that. So let's transition to, um, how Travis or I'm sorry, how Kennedy's, uh, defensive solution came about and then what you're doing now, which is now you're a full-time police officer, um, getting started into that. So that'll be exciting to talk about, but, um, what started Kennedy defensive solution and how'd you get involved in that? Yeah. When I got out, I had no intentions on starting a business at all. Um, so that wasn't even on the forefront of my mind. Um, so I got out working jobs. Like I worked for SpaceX for like a month. Then I went to grad school. I did some like contract. I did a couple of contracting gigs with this, uh, with the private security company ran by team, former team guys. And it was just kind of like contracting gigs, um, doing private security. Is that stateside or uh, Sorry, both. I didn't mean under states? Okay. Yeah. Only, only place I went to was Mexico, but yeah, mainly stateside, but a couple of times it was Mexico. And then, uh, did that kind of paid the bills. I went to grad, I was going to grad school, um, here locally in uh, Orange County. Uh, it's cause we're, I kind of moved back here cause it's my family, uh, is still, still here. So moved back here, was doing that. And then it wasn't until I took out like a, a couple of family friends, my dad, that took out a couple, like a friend of his and then a couple of family friends to the range. And th- these dudes are like avid shooters. They like, they're into firearms and stuff like that. So I was like, yeah, I'll go out and shoot with you boys. Um, started train, kind of just teaching them, kind of doing my thing, instructing, cause I'm used to doing it. Cause I did it when I just got out, we teach firearms all the time. Um, so it kind of came natural to me and I kind of got like this epiphany. I was like, well, I don't want to work for any work for anyone else. I didn't at the time because I I tried the whole private security at SpaceX. I didn't like it. It was boring. Um, the company was cool, but I didn't like the job. I just didn't like the duties. Um, the contracting stuff was, I kind of liked, but then again, it was like traveling all the time, which I didn't want to do because I kind of got out for that reason anyway. But I was like, you know what? Maybe I could just start something on my own. And with the firearms thing, because when I was there, I was like, I could do this. Um, kind of hit the ground running and basically in Orange County where I live, I mean, a lot of it's conservative in general, this area in SoCal and a lot of, a lot of gun owners. I think California in general, there's just a lot of pro 2A people, a lot of, a lot of pro gun people. Um, for most people may not believe that, but there is, there's a, there's a big gun community in California. Um, I'm like, I'm sitting there going, there is. Uh, uh, I, I honestly think so, but I mean, I, I mean, from my experience being here, like in, in this business here, um, yeah, it's pretty big. I mean, especially in, I don't know about NorCal, but SoCal. Yes. I mean, in Orange County, um, this area, of SoCal, a lot, of, it's very highly conservative, um, mm. you know, Republican type people. So they're in a pro program, but anyways, like I was like, you know, I want to, I, then I got passionate and I was like, you know, I want to start my own thing. Um, I got really motivated. My, then I, my dad, he, 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 has, he owns, excuse me, he owns his own business. Um, he's a wedding photographer, so he knows about kind of starting up his own thing. So he, I'm right. Hey, full circle. Hey dad, show me the ropes. How do you start a business? So <laughs> he, he kind of showed me the ropes, how to start a business. Um, and then once I kind of got all, all the legalities out of the way, I hit the ground running, dude. I mean, I basically just started out word of mouth for one. It was just like friends and then all referrals and just doing private lessons only. I kind of just, like we talked about, I kind of just, hey, I got a business name, became like an LLC, threw up like this easy do-it-yourself website, which I built and kind of just build some credibility there and put my name out there as best I could. And I just started doing private lessons and I just built my for civilians or yeah. law enforcement. What's that? C- civilian civilians or law enforcement started out doing civilians. Okay. And then it kind of, then it bled into, I started doing just private lessons with cops that reached out to me, not like at the department paid for or anything like that at the time, but it was, Hey, just private 
copper is, Hey, looking for some more training, um, doing that. And then at the time I became friends with, with Sean and like people, other people in the industry. And then that's when I kind of like came together with these people and they mentored me and how to do business marketing and kind of build it. I built it up from there. Um, and I still continued even mm-hmm. throughout my, my main focus was private lessons, dude. Uh, that's why I, I really enjoyed the most. And then I started doing a handful of law enforcement groups, a couple of local SWAT teams, um, in the area of local agencies, and then still doing like private lessons with, uh, other cops here and there, but on their own dime. Um, we touched on, did like private training seminars for departments, just let them pay. I would just show up for two hours, train them and because half the time they, they won't pay, uh, no fault of their own. That's just how, it, how it is. Um, yeah, just, yeah, just how, just how it is. It's his name in the game, but did that. And at the same time, like having that for, I've had the business for about two years now, uh, learned a shit ton. Of, I think it's fun having something of your own. Um, that's where I became more passionate. I mean, I, and when I, when it came to like, especially mm-hmm. at the time, um, paying my bills, putting food on the table and stuff like that, like and really establishing a new identity and a new career when I got out of the military. Uh, I loved it. I thought it was fun, you know, especially I got to shoot and stuff like that and then train people. So it was a good time. For those interested in it, uh, what, what kind of training is it? Is it just static shooting? Is it mobile shooting? Is it, you know, entry training? Is it rifle? So it's, yeah, it's, all the way from beginner to like advanced shooters, but mainly just um, rifle pistol shooting and basically combat shooting, um, close quarter shooting, uh, static and dynamic. So moving and shooting drills and heavily uh, manipulation more. So I would say with rifle um, than pistol. Um, But 90% of my clientele, the people I trained were brand new. Beginners, um, taught mostly handgun artists, and some people just never even touched a handgun. Um, and it, and especially during what was going on in the world at this past couple of years, the mm-hmm. business kind of boomed then too, because everyone was nervous. Um, a lot of people were seeking training. Uh, so it just, mm-hmm. the whole industry kind of just boomed, you know, not only just on my end, but like even other businesses and stuff too. So yeah, everybody was out buying guns and. You couldn't even couldn't even find ammo for the longest time. Yeah. It's still really hard to find ammo, you know, because everybody was swooping that up. But um, so uh, I'm just curious, actually. So when you were training law enforcement officers, like, were you kind of coming into these programs or training these guys, and you're kind of like, man, you guys are a little out of whack. Like, <laughs> no, <laughs> no, I, I no, not at all, not at all, dude. I uh, I didn't think they're out of whack. Um, I definitely thought they'd always they need more training, more shooting, more time behind the gun. Definitely. You know, everyone does to include myself, but, uh, yeah, like, yeah, definitely me. Yeah. It, it's, and it's well, now being a cop, I know how it's difficult. Like there, there's very little time for that, but there is time, but it just, it's yeah. just hard to do sometimes. But yeah, I was always pumped when I actually, when cops reached out to me to train, I started up my first cop. I trained was this chick that went to the gym with me. I mean, really? yeah, she was like, she was a local cop. She's like, Oh, you start, you train. Like I need some training. And she's like, I'm like, all right, yeah. Yeah, come on. That's cool. And hey, good for her for wanting to get better. Yeah. You know, Cause, and it just kind of stemmed from there, you know, and then like all it took was one. And then she referred me to her friends and kind of just, then it's kind of pinballed from there. But no, I always enjoy, like for me, when I instruct, I got the most fulfillment out of people. Like when I train cops, because I know they're, utilizing those skills day in and day out in real life situations. Yeah. So I took sure. it upon myself to make sure like teach them more advanced stuff. Um, just go that kind of extra mile, not say I wouldn't do it with my other customers, but I think back, there's, there's certain things that I wouldn't teach like a regular civilian that I would have cop, you know, just, oh, sure. that's just the nature of it. Just yeah. like when I was overseas, I wouldn't train the partner for us, the same skill sets, the tactics, that I know to them, it just doesn't yeah, happen. Right. <laughs> you right, gotta, right. you gotta, you gotta like sugarcoat it a little bit. Um, yeah. I mean, it makes sense. That's just, that was my mentality. 
Yeah, I mean, dude, the reality is like cops, and we say it all the time in almost all of our episodes, is like cops do not get enough quality training. And I get it. There's just not enough time, money. I mean, there's a lot of politics involved in what we do. And that's just, I guess it's sad to say, but I mean, I get it. It's Those cards aren't on the table for us, right? Like, you know, we all know. All three of us can sit here and say, like, we don't get enough training, period. Especially in when you talk about shooting, it's very minimal. Like I, I th- really, you probably go to the range a few times a year as a department to qualify. I mean, I think totally about different. that. Every department is different too. So, I mean, you may not even get that. Yeah. Like some departments probably go once or twice a year and you're literally given this piece of equipment that can take a life and you're given very minimal training on it. You know, I don't know. That seems crazy to me. Um, I do want to ask you a question. I get into a lot of arguments with with some guys over this. Um, oh, I like arguing. Yeah, it's about, uh, you know, um, finding your front sight or a lot of guys are buying these RMR, you know, red dot sights for their handguns now. It's, it's, it's becoming a pretty popular thing. Uh, for a long time, at least for, for everywhere I've ever worked, uh, which has only been two agencies, but you were never allowed to carry, you're never allowed to have a a sight on your firearm, your, your handgun. Right. So, uh, more and more guys are starting to get it. It's, it, you know, they've been approved to have them. Um, the issue I have with that is, okay, I'll take a guy like you, for example, right. You are super proficient in shooting in the seal teams. How often do you guys think you shot? At least daily. daily yeah. Daily. Or three, four times yeah, a every week. Day. Yeah, exactly. So thousands of rounds, probably a week for you guys to train, right? So you're very, very proficient at it. Take a cop and they're not proficient, not not even remotely close to the level that you're at. Um, and my problem with, with these is a lot of guys that haven't been in some type of real world shooting, um, and we discussed this on the phone last night, is, um, you know, and what we do for a living now, like usually most officer-involved shootings happen within a fairly close distance of each other, Um you know, you're being shot at or whatever the case may be, but obviously it's at a high stress, but it's in close proximity to somebody. Um, and I think a lot of guys are getting these and they're like <clears throat> thinking that when the time comes down to that, if, if they get involved in some type of deadly encounter like that, that they're going to result into actually coming up, finding their front sights or the little red dot and applying that in the real world. And I'm like, I'm like, I'm like, dude, I, I don't think so. Like I've been in several shootings and I, I can honestly say like not once, not one time do I remember even finding, even looking for my front sight in the middle of a gunfight. Um, now I know you're going to have some opposition to this, which is, which is good. And that's why I'm bringing it up. Cause I want to ask you, cause I think you're an expert in this, but um, I like his world. Well, I like to tell guys, I'm like, Hey, at the range, like, you should probably focus, be focusing more on the limited time that you're going to get to train. Cause I do not think they're ever going to get that proficient at finding their sights like that. Like get your gun up and get some rounds down range as fast as you can effectively and as accurate as you possibly can. Um, because I see them out there and they're like, it takes them like a second or two to find that red dot. And let's be honest, like a second or two could be yeah, forever. That's, that's going to be, that could be the difference between living yeah. and not. Um, like what's your take on that? My take on before Travis wrecks your world. Can I, can I yes, interject please. something? Go ahead. <laughs> like, like, Tra- he's like, <clears throat> he like wants to wring my neck. He's like, well, I, well, I mean like you, you said that you don't remember seeing fighting your front I, side. I, didn't. Or, okay. I, I just, I didn't, I, I, but do you think that it's possible that your muscle memory and you know, that's high stress that you don't remember that maybe you did. And other than that, you know, maybe you agree or disagree, but do you, do you not think that anything that, that gives you a tactical advantage, whether you use it or don't, cause it's not in the way. I can honestly say, dude, like I've been in shootings where I use my handgun and my rifle. Not, I didn't like, I didn't did you use a red dot on your rifle one time. And that's, that was something. Yeah. Different. I think okay. with, well, yeah, the ahead, rifle Travis. red dot, you're going <laughs> to use it because most often than not, you, you got some time and distance you know, with, with the rifle, unless you're like going in with the right room clearance with the rifle, but you're still using it. Even when I look back, I use my red dot on the rifle all the time. But I think with the pistol, I'm a huge advocate. Hey, you better ma- be a master with the irons and kind of graduate up to the red dot. If you think you're going to succeed mm-hmm. in pistol in firearms, that's my opinion. That's like, 
the adage like not learning how to use a compass and just solely relying on a GPS. You need to have it. Just like on my rifle, I have my nice EOTech, but I also have my iron sights in case that fails me, which more often than not, it probably will in a real world situation. So I need to know how to use iron sights. So I'm a huge advocate of that. And I think, yeah, being proficient, like he mentioned, like you have that muscle memory where intuitively you drew and you presented in a nice straight line and you have that nice natural point of aim with the handgun. And you already know this because you practice this and drilled this hundreds of times that because I know within five yards, I don't really, I don't need to look at the sights at all. I just look at the target and I could point mm-hmm. and shoot and hit dead center and do a nice, decent grouping. Mm-hmm. That's just me personally. And anything within that, like I'll just, I'll crush. But I think it just over time is as you kind of hone your skills, like, like you said, in times of stress, like I can't remember when I presented, you really don't think you might focus on that front. like I'm taking a long shot. A nice front sight picture. No, that doesn't happen in the real world because you just don't have time. It just happens like that. You just start shooting. Yeah, thank you. Like you mentioned, most gunfights, what, three to six yards in kind of in the police world. They're really close. Um, that's why bad guys get lucky. Mm-hmm. You don't really need to be talented, you know, sometimes when you're that close. But uh, yeah. I agree with you, you know, but it comes down to you're right. I've seen coppers it takes them forever just to even draw they're like doing this weird thing with their bail like or their als system like they're kind of unlock it then they kind of find a grip and pull it out like all of these little things is what hems them up and those little fine muscle mm-hmm. movements that need to just be, be ingrained to the point where you all you have to do you, you've done this so many times where you present a straight line your sights aren't crooked your front your front sight post isn't off to the right or whatever you have a nice trigger squeeze um red dot for me I'm not used to it. Like I just started kind of using it recently and it's difficult to find the red dot, especially if I'm, if you're trained on irons. Um, if you grew up on red dot, it might be easier, but you still need to learn how to shoot with an iron sight. Uh, and the reason I, the reason I bring it up is because like, like I said, I just, I don't think that most, most officers are uh, proficient enough to, to just slap one of those things on there because and what I'm afraid of is, what, someone's going to put that on their gun and they're going to like have this self-confidence about themselves. Like, Oh, gonna be you know, super accurate. I, I, yeah. I'm going to be super accurate or whatever, but I'm afraid that it, and it probably wouldn't even happen anyways, because if it came down in the real world, they're not even going to look for it. They're just going to shoot. But in their head, I would, I would be afraid that a guy or, or gal is going to pull their gun out. And in a, and I'm talking like a real life situation where they're having to fire, fire at somebody and look for that red dot. And you know, they're sitting there tweaking, tweaking with it, trying to find it. And then it's like game's over. I would be afraid that that happens. To be honest, I, I pitched, I pitched to, to my admin when they, when they approved them, I was like, I don't think we should allow people to have them because, um, I, I don't know. I, it's, to me, it's like, dude, we are not even proficient enough to be having something like that. And I would just be afraid that guys are going to use it as a crutch and spend way too much time trying to train to find that thing and not training for what they should be training for. Like, does but, that, does that make any sense to anybody? But I mean, like you, you, you brought it up that we're, we're trained to find our front site. We're trained to find our front site, or at least I have been in my, in we my all shooting. Are. Okay. And you said that you, you didn't do it. So what's, what's the difference? I'm trained to find a red dot. I'm trying to find a front site, but when shit hits the fan, I'm just going to put rounds on that person and eliminate the threat. Well, there's the way I look at it, but if I have a red dot and it helps me, that's great. If I don't and it doesn't help me, then I, I'm going purely on science and experience. And the science behind it is when you get in and you can contest Travis, like if you're getting into a gunfight or whatever, um, you know, your brain is going to take over at that point and you know, you're going to hone in on the threat. You're going to get tunnel vision on that threat. And if someone's shooting at you, that threat's going to be the gun. And a lot of times, Cops get their guns shot out of their hands. Their hands or arms get shot. Um, same with bad guys. You know, co- a lot of cops shoot hands, guns. Um, I can think two, two of mine, we shot the freaking gun out of the guy's hands. So, I mean, that's not because we're aiming for the gun. That's just because that's just where our where my brain focused in on. Yep. Um, you know, tunnel, tunnel vision on the gun. And so your brain is aiming for you. What I'm trying to get at is I don't think – cops should be using those or relying on them unless you're very, very, very proficient at a, at, at a guy like probably your level to, to even use it. And, um, I lost my train of thought on that. Damn it. Well, but, well I don't but, think that, I don't think that a cop 
especially when it comes to firearms, but I don't think a cop should be relying on any equipment that they have. 100%, I, I don't trust my best. I don't trust that my gun's going to work every time. I don't trust that my sight's going to work every time, but I got to have backup plans. And, you know, in a gun, I don't have many backup plans, tap, rack, reload, whatever it is. But sights, I mean, I, I don't know. Like, my sights are work great in the range, but I don't know if they're going to work great when I'm under stress. But I don't rely on it and say, hey, that's the only thing I have. I guess what I was getting at in, is um, – I, I, I... Training guys to stand on a freaking line at five yards at, at, at a static position and tell them to get their gun out, you know, do the five step draw, whatever. That's obviously find stupid. their sights. All right, find your sights. You know, take it at slow and accurate. Like I'm like, what? No, like no. You're at five yards, seven yards. Get your goddamn gun out. Get point and shoot effectively as fast as you can, and just see how accurate you are. And induce a little bit of stress into that on top of that. Don't just stand there and get your gun out and shoot. Like, a timer. use a shot clock timer. Yes, thank you. Use a shot clock timer. That, by default, is going to add stress into you because you know you're being timed. Whether whether you think so or not, it's going to. And then, you know, I, I take it so far as to be like, I'll tell our range instructors, like, hey, if I'm going to go up on the line or whatever, dude, I don't want to just stand there and, you know, you give me a command of threat and I point and shoot. I want to I want to get my heart rate elevated a little bit, so I'll be like, "Hey, let's sprint forty yards, come back, get to the line, and then shoot." Um, I just feel like in in our society, in law enforcement, I think we kind of do ourselves a dis- disservice by training like that. I, I don't know, man. I could be way off. I'm just like I said, dude. I'm going based off of science, what I know and experience, and that's all I know. Yeah, and and I and I I think that you have a lot of great points, and I know Travis is probably got way more and way more experience than me so i don't want to cut him off too much here but do you not think that like the sitting staying there and shooting not moving or whatever those are teaching you the fundamentals not the not necessarily what's yes. going to happen but sight picture you know slow squeeze all that good stuff that you know we all need to learn where otherwise we just go up there run around and i just pull the gun <laughs> and just start fucking capping well, rounds mean- <laughs> and then i'm a gangster who's holding my gun like this but i don't I mean-, mean that but i know there's a time and a place for it and for sure like the fundamentals like absolutely i'm not saying that but like it shouldn't be all you teach like there's got to be some stress involved in shooting absolutely right. period That's absolutely just, and yeah a simple know. shot timer does the trick i'm more often than not even with inex- with especially with inexperienced shooters um yeah and even most cops i train they're not used to the shot climber shot timer because Unless you're like SWAT, SWAT does it, but like regular cops, most, well, at least they told me they don't use them. So I'm like, yeah, you need to get that. Uh, my department does pretty yeah. much that's all like, the time. Not, that's like a critical t- tool to like become a better shot. You know, just, mm-hmm. it's a must. In my eyes, it's a must. But back to the red dot, it never should be a false sense of security. I agree. Yeah. yeah. If you're going to have that piece of gear on your on you, you better damn sure know how to use it efficiently. Um and I always go back, you better know how that thing shuts off for whatever reason. You have to change the battery in a fucking year or whatever, or it's too bright, it's fucking blurring out your target Yeah. because you're in indoors now. You need to know how to use iron sights or you need to lo- lo- rely on that good natural point of aim, tar- you know, presentation, trigger squeeze, and then you pull the trigger. So you need to either, like they always say, like rise to the occasion or you're going to fall back to the level of your training. And if your level of training yeah. is... Hey, get online. All right, guys, threat. T- five seconds later, one. You know, it's that's what you're going to revert to. So yeah, if you're not practicing, if they're not, you know, the, the training department or whatever is not adding some stress, um, adding, I'm a huge, manipulations, dealing with malfunctions, because you see it all the time, these, oh, these videos, the coppers get malfunctions. Yeah, so it's like, and you're like, holy shit, how does this come out? But hey, you just never know. Do up close and personal something puts it out of battery or whatever the case happens. Um, and the magazine's been jammed forever. Springs are bad. You know, just haven't. It, it's just so many things could happen if you don't have that muscle memory built in with how to do your immediate remedial action drills and you know, dealing with these things. I mean, you're done. You know, I've seen all the time, even my train in my department too, like people. Their movements off, you know, their the basic the baseline, you know, they learn it in the academy, then it kind of goes away, just like with anything, dude. If you learn something, you never practice, it's gone. So yeah, and doing it once a month, once a quarter, no, it's not going to cut it. And let, and there's guys out there that go the extra mile and um and seek training, 
and go on their own. Uh, but sometimes, like we t- always fall back. It's hard to do sometimes. But I think I think the majority don't. Yeah, I would That's say the majority reality. doesn't. The majority they're, they're, they're still some of the hitters, but you're right. Majority doesn't. Yeah. But I'm yeah. the majority. Like, I'll, I'll get off my soapbox yeah. on that. I just I don't know. I figure while well, I have you on here, I'm gonna I want to pick your brain on that. And if I had money, I'd buy him a red dot for his pistol. Buy him RMR. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I would. I, I personally wouldn't use it, but I, that's because I know I'm. I'm not proficient. I think at if it. you're a good shooter, the RMR will take you to that next level, in my opinion. Because yeah, to me, it's more like a like a, a sport shooting thing. Yeah, but, and speed, and it opens up your field of view. Just like you're shooting with a rifle, EOTech, aim point, or whatever. Like, you know, you see like inexperienced shooters are like they'll close one eye or. They're not used to shooting mm-hmm. with both eyes open, but with you know with the RMR or whatever reflex sight, you have that field of view now. You know you can shoot yeah. with both eyes open. You could be target fixated. Vice, hey, where's my front sight at? Oh, I have an acceptable front sight. You know, target's blurry, front sight's clear. But yeah, that kind of that's like the next step, and you have to be at a certain point to kind of, in my opinion, graduate to that level. And I know our SWAT guys that probably about fifty fifty. And, but they train twice a week. So, you know, and and for them, you know, they're proficient shooters. They shoot a shit ton and, and good for them. And if it gives them a tactical advantage, I think it should 100% be an option. I think you should be proficient in it. Like you said, but anything that can help. I I was talking about your average patrol guy. I'm not talking about like a, you know, a unit in specializing that shoots all the time. Like I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about your average patrol guy, but that doesn't, that's, that's not the, the point is if you're proficient in it, you're proficient in it. It doesn't matter if you're working in our, in a jail, working on the street, working, whatever, if you're proficient in it and you can use it to help you out and, and give you a tactical advantage, then fucking go for it. Yeah, I guess. I don't know. Whatever. It should, it should be an option as long as you can use it. Sure. Whatever. <laughs> we'll talk about this later. <laughs> All right. We're, we're, I'm over that, but, uh, I don't know. I kind of feel like we're on the same page here a little bit, but no, uh, no one's on the same page. Well, we're you're not, I, I'm on the same page with Travis here. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> um, all right. So you started, uh, we, we kind of went kind of way off topic. That was my fault, but, yeah, um, fuck you. <laughs> you started, uh, you, yeah, you're, you're shooting, your shooting business. So that, that obviously sounds like it took off doing well. Um, Let's get wrapped into how'd you get in law enforcement? Like what made you decide I want to become a police officer? And I know I'd heard somewhere listening to one of your old podcasts, you had applied with the FBI, didn't get it kind of a gut punch to you. Yeah. So that was my, that was my game plan in the beginning. So like I got like a year before I got out going through that process, made it pretty far. I may have not just, I, I don't think I passed the poly yet. They didn't tell me what I failed in. But I went through like all the phases and the last thing was the poly. So you get a conditional, mm-hmm. do the poly and you get the job, you pass the poly. But I may have not passed it. Yeah. I don't know. They didn't tell me. But <laughs> well, did you tell the truth? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But uh <laughs> yeah, that's, well the funny thing no, is like sometimes. <laughs> two other guys, so three of us, there's three of us, we're doing the same thing, same and none of us got it. I don't know. Really? I'm not I don't believe that it. I don't like put on my tin pull hat here, but anyways, it wasn't meant to be. <laughs> it yeah, wasn't meant to be obviously but i was kind of like gearing towards that you know because i got into it because law enforcement has always been on like kind of the forefront of my mind i thought i wasn't going to get out after bud's instructor you know like I, in, uh, back then i was like i have an uncle he's a he's a copper in um in inland empire uh kind of near where i live and picked his brain i started reaching out to like where I was living, local city um, in uh, San Diego, their PD, just to get information. But I ended up not pulling it, getting out. I got a position, just the, a leadership position that I wanted. So I stayed in the military. Fast forward now, when I was interacting with more cops again, I started becoming friends with them, friends with cops at my gym. I started getting a bug again. And it's always been there, but I was like, mm-hmm. you know what, this something want to do FBI fell through. I was fucking pissed about that. Um, yeah, I was, but now where I'm at now, I'm glad I'm not in the FBI. That's just me. But That's yeah, I fit, fun. I fit in, in, in local, in where I'm at now. This is being a, a city cop. I think it fits my personality and fits me, but mm-hmm. it didn't work out. So I kind of said, Hey, screw this. 
whatever screw becoming a cop at this moment in time. And then when I got friends with local cops, I got the bug. Local agency was hiring. So I said, hey, you know what? I'm going to put it in a application. I'm going to commit. Um, this was last year. And they picked me up. I just went smoothly through the hiring process. Freaking, they were really fast. And I passed everything. Um, and it just, it felt right at the time, like kind of all stars aligned. It just felt, I felt good. Um, I didn't know anybody personally at this department. Um, uh, I was only put in touch with somebody and never met him personally, just through a guy I met in my gym. He was best friend. One of his mm-hmm. best friends worked at this department I work at now. And he kind of picked his brain, um, on it, on how the department is, the people, the morale, you know, what's it like working there because of what was going on in our, in our economy and stuff like that. I was kind of concerned, but it worked out and I'm, I'm very pleased. So that's, that's what kind of geared me towards that. And I, now I regret it. I freaking love it now. Yeah, that's cool. That's really cool. I'm, I'm glad that you uh, chased down that dream of doing that. Um, we already, we already kind of talked about the, uh, the Academy, uh, unless there's anything else you wanted to add on, on your experience through the Academy. I mean, I'm sure in your eyes it had to have been, I don't want to say a joke, but yeah, I mean, it was, not I wouldn't say like it was a joke. I mean, there were some times it was difficult, uh, physically. No, I mean, it, I didn't yeah. go to become physically challenged, you know, to get a physical challenge out of whatever, but I went there with open mind. It was, I think for me was the hardest part was just kind of conforming to all like their protocol, their military bearing stuff and kind of mm-hmm. reverting back to how I was back when I first joined the Navy. That was difficult for me being older um, and being having my experience. I thought that was the most difficult challenge of the whole process. Yeah. Um, and developing myself and just thinking like a cop in general um, was hard for me. Some At certain times, like in the beginning, like when we actually started doing like actual hands-on training like scenarios and stuff like that, like mm-hmm. the, the tangible skills, like dealing with stress, firearms, like all that stuff that I carried over. That was, that came natural and easy to me. Um, yeah. When we started doing training, like just talking with people, figuring out which laws they're breaking, what mm-hmm. I could use to my advantage, what do I have, what do I don't have, those types of thinking like that was was kind of difficult for me at first. Uh, I'm not just not used to it. Yeah. Well, and, you weren't. You probably weren't. <laughs> You weren't conversating with the terrorists back in, back overseas, or <laughs> yeah, no it was like very for me. I look back, like, oh, this is pretty simple. Bad guy, yeah. take care of business, you know. But yeah, I have to worry about all these laws and all this case law and all this stuff. But yeah, it was overall it was a good experience, and the instructors there were solid, and it still was like a stress academy. It wasn't like a college mm-hmm. course. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah. It, was, it was it was good. What, was it was it difficult sometimes? Like I, I'm guessing that you know you guys did uh, you know arrest control or whatever they call it there, yeah. And you know like ground fighting and stuff like that. And instructors telling you you got to you know put your hand this way and do this, and you're like, <laughs> I, I can think of an easier way of doing this, but you're like, okay, I just got to drink this Kool Aid for <laughs> yeah, a minute or to. whatever. Oh yeah, was was that difficult? Yeah, it was. Yeah, because you're just. I was thinking myself like this. This is not practical. Like, I don't know, yeah. I never do this, like gun takeaways and like these weird things. But yeah. <laughs> I think it's just, yeah, yeah, <laughs> beating a dummy with a baton. But it's like, yeah, yeah those types of things, I was like, whatever. I, I looked at myself, I was like, yeah. I don't know if that would work in real life, but it is what it is. Just just learn it. Um, just do it. Yeah. They kind of implemented some new stuff, like a lot of the arrest and control instructors or whatever, they mainly jujitsu dudes. So they, they kind of updated the curriculum, I would say a little bit and it was pretty good. I mean, yeah, they did their due diligence. Well, I mean, they take I that just, shit seriously. I just speak for my, myself, I guess, you know, going to the Academy, going through further training and you know, advanced officer training, whatever you want to call it. Yeah. You know, there's, you know, they'll be like, okay, this is how you grab a guy's hand and you got to put it here. You put your knee here. <laughs> yeah. And, you're like, and, what? And, you, know, you go through and you're like, dude, have you, have you done this? Before, in real life, like in yeah. real life, it's like get on the ground. You drop a knee on the guy, grab his arms, and put him in handcuffs. And if he wants to give you a fight, then then you there do you some other stuff. But but I mean, like it's not like my knee goes. Where's my? 
I got to hold my hand like this or, yeah. you know, and, and, and it's just like, I think that there is a disconnect there in law enforcement. And, and I think yeah. it probably would go back in training wise. I could say that it's the same thing as your static point, shoot, fine thing, you know, yeah. learning the fundamentals. And, and obviously they, they go down the drain really quick sometimes, but uh, fundamentals are, are, are key. I guess it, it would be my only argument to that. Yeah. All right. So you got graduated the academy, which is we all know six, but six, six months, months long, right? Yeah. So we, it's coming, kind of. Well, for what we do for for work, it's not that long. But when you're in it, kind of drags on. Oh, you're yeah. like, ugh, is this is this almost done? Yeah, yeah. By the end of it, you're so, like, damn, this is just taking forever. I just want to get the hell out of there. Yeah. Yeah. So after you graduate, um, obviously you rolled right into FTO field training. Um, how was that like rolling into to FTO? I mean. Obviously, you're freaking FTOs, and I'm sure everybody at your department knows your skill set and what you did. Um, that had to be intimidating for them. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, maybe maybe it was. Sometimes I felt it. I felt like it, it, sometimes it was like a pissing contest or something. Like, oh, you know what you're doing. I'm like, dude, no, I don't. I would always first hand get the car like, dude, I don't know what the fuck I'm doing. I don't know how to be yeah. a cop. Yeah. Who cares? I was a steal. It's nothing to do with this right now. You know, yeah. I, I could shoot. Yeah. Okay. But there's a lot more to it, but I would kind of like put that disclaimer out, but dude, all of IFTOs were real laid back and real, like they were good mentors. They weren't like, yeah. Um, and they, they taught me and I was like, I mentioned this before I was blessed with good FTOs. I was, they felt good to be done with the Academy and actually being on the street, even though I was with yeah. my you know, FTO, but I was still out there actually doing the job for real. So mm-hmm. to me, that's satisfying. And I was like, okay, all this training you did, now it's time to put it in, in the real world where you really tested that. I mean, Academy is one thing, but you, you really learn on FTO. It's kind of like you yeah. make your bed there and see how you are as a real cop on yep. the street. Uh, yeah, for sure. That was like the testament for me. And then we had, we do five phases in my FTO in field training. So each phase is about a month long. Uh, the, the last phase is only four days, but four the other four phases are a month long. And yeah, like a shadow phase. Yeah, the shadow, last phase like a shadow phase. Uh, yeah, but yeah. yeah, it was it was legit. I mean, I, I had a good time. I had really good FTOs, like I mentioned, and it was fun. I mean, I got to see it all kind of the good, the bad, the ugly, you know. And then I could just kind of take it all in. Hey, I don't like that. I like that. Yeah. What. Uh... Let's hear some um, good rookie mistakes that you made on FTO. <laughs> I know you've got some. We've all got some. Uh, how about how about do you remember? Do you like remember the first time you arrested your first guy, your your first criminal? Do you remember your first arrest? Yeah, yeah, vaguely. I don't know. In first, when I was in phase one, oh my god, dude, I was like. I was like overly stressed about where I was all the time. Like not, I mean, I didn't even know what half the time where the fuck I was. And he'd be like, where are we at? I don't know. Or putting on the radio, like yeah. completely wrong area or just like mumbling <laughs> yeah. on the radio. Cause I had to pull out my packs. Yeah. They wouldn't allow us to wear earpieces. I had to pull it out and talk and then like really sound like a stoop sandwich on the radio. Not even know where the hell I'm at. Yeah, even though I'm used to funny. talk on the radio, but it's just, it's one thing when you're driving I don't know the city, so I got to, like, look where I'm at. I got to know these 100 blocks, mm-hmm. addresses, and stuff like that. Um, that was, like, the stressful part. of it. Getting out and, like, talking to people, like, I didn't really mind, but all that other auxiliary, you know, ancillary stuff, like, that that stressed me out. Did you ever get stumped on a call as, as, like, a new guy on FTO, and you're like, God, I legitimately don't know what to do, and you're like, look at your FTO, and you're like, I, I don't know. Oh, yeah, I, know I looked on, like, I don't even know what we got. He'd be like, what do we got? I'm like, oh, yeah. I have no idea. <laughs> like, yeah. Or like, hey, you were doing a DV. Like, did you give her a DV plan- pamphlet? I'm like, no. Oh, what if, you know, I'd like, it looked like an idiot because I didn't give her resources or whatever. Something. Yeah. That they may seem yeah, small and silly. silly, but it's like, or I didn't fill out a good FI. I didn't get everything. I have to call them back or, you know, I didn't get all their information. Yeah. And just look like a fool. But Did, a lot of times when I, in the beginning was like, they were like, what do we have? And I'm just like, I don't know. I'm like, I don't even know what, <laughs> yeah. what law they're breaking. Yeah. Like, what, what penal code have we got? 
or what are they, you know, violating? I'm like, so that, that part is, was yeah, pretty I, I give up what? Yeah. No, I, I, I think we all can relate to that oh, at, at some point in training where we're like, yeah, I, I, I don't know <laughs> yeah. what I'm doing. Completely yet. stumped. <laughs> I would just be blatantly yeah. honest. Or I wouldn't even out. try to fake it. So I make, I'd be like, sir, oh, I don't yeah. know. I'll, or I'd be like, sir, I have no idea where I'm at. <laughs> yeah. Can I pull over? Yeah. I was like, <laughs> can I pull over and grab curb? So I can figure I have to pull up my big map and look down and be like, oh, I was 2300, like a hundred blocks. My officer's index book and yeah, yeah, all this whole thing, this whole charade. I'm like, there's a GPS right there. Like, can I just look at? It? Nope, turn it off. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it paid dividends. Now I, I appreciate down. that shit because it works. So yeah, it, yeah, it, it's, mean, it and it's crucial. Yeah, that's funny. I mean, I don't know. I mean, do you remember like? Uh, you've been like your first car chase or like something stressful where you're trying to talk on the radio and you completely screw it up and your FTO is like, just stop, dude, pull over. (laughs) You're done. Um, sound like an idiot on the radio. Yeah. I haven't had like, where like you stopped me. I have been in a couple pursuits already. Um, and I called them, but I never, like even during training, it was, I never had that experience where like, Hey, Hey Travis, stop what you're doing and just walk away. Or like, I'll take over. Like, I never really shit the bed that much, but thank God I kind of just <laughs> played it off. Like sometimes you just walk up, like, oh, I got this. I'll just figure it out. Mm-hmm. I would always like walk past my FTO and leave him in the back, like pretend he's not even there. That just helped yeah. me. Yeah. And especially and then you yeah. got another, another like trainee coming up with you on the call and you're like, Hey dude, just pretend they're not even there. They're going to be back there on their cell phones anyway. Let's handle this, figure this mm-hmm. shit out. Uh, Mm -hmm. yeah, it's, it's tough when someone's breathing down your neck, even though like, you know what to do, like just the thought of like this, someone breathing down your neck and really no matter what you do is it's going to be wrong or you're going to screw something up. So it's like that little level of stress of someone just sitting next to you that is just analyzing your every move, you know, it's it's annoying. Yeah. It's annoying. By the end of it, I was like, (laughs) I'm so sick of having someone in my car with me. Like I was like, yeah, I want to be by myself, but I I fucked up plenty. I still fuck up now. Yeah. So it's like, oh, I try my best not do, to, man. you know, but it's like, I'm still learning. So, yeah. So how long have you been as a solo now as a, as a patrol guy? A few weeks. <laughs> oh man. So you're fresh, yeah. fresh off training. Nice. And you're, you're working nights now, huh? Yeah. I work nights now and I'm on a good, blessed to be on a good team. Um, I work with one of my FTOs and it's like, two older dudes and three brand new people on the team. That's cool. Yeah. When you get, when you get a good on a good patrol team with like a good sergeant or a good supervisor, man, this is the best time ever. Like I can remember the people or times that I had like solid teams and just freaking having so much fun. I mean, Oh yeah. That makes it, that's why I've realized too, in the team, like going to different teams throughout training and you see like the different crews, the different type of people and just how it operates. You're like, dude, the, it's the people is what makes it no matter what oh, shift totally. you're on. I could be on the shitty day shift or whatever. Like if I'm with the right people. Like it's going to make my time that 12 hours go by like that, you know? Yeah. Makes it or breaks it for sure. And then you've, you'll experience getting on like a real crappy team and it's like, just dread coming to work, you know, your boss, you and your boss aren't on the same page or you and the other officers you work with are, they're into something like totally different. It just makes for kind of a crappy time. But uh, man, if you get stuck on a really good team, it is a blast. Oh, I love it. Loved it. Um, now you are the, the, the leader of, I know now I am the, now I'm the sergeant and I'm like, yeah, <laughs> now it's them I, wouldn't, I wouldn't want to work for you. <laughs> Yeah, now I'm a I'm a weekend graveyard sergeant, so you know the guys I'm getting are and, and gals are brand brand new, like just getting off FTO. Um, so that and that that's challenging in and of itself. But um, I pretty much spent my entire patrol career in graveyards, and that was by choice. I I could have so I could have switched over, but I I love graveyards to this day. I mean, if you, if you like going after bad guys. And girls, they're they're at night. That's when they're doing their crimes for yeah. the most part. And you know that. And and I don't really like taking paper, so there's less oh, yeah. paper at night. Too. <laughs> yeah. Graves and like swing yeah. shift are my favorite that we have. So it's yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh so yeah, less paper I at night. See, uh, day shift like paper city. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, 
you all roll into work and uh, your partner's like, hey, Travis, what time did you get up today? You're like, I haven't slept in like two days. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm good. <laughs> um, yeah. Anyways, that's cool, man. I'm, I'm glad you're doing uh, the cop thing. Is there anything, do you know what you want to do in, in the profession? Like, you know, I could push canine on you and tell you how cool that is if you want. Yeah. Is there something I mean, you want to do? There's not something I'm like heart set on right now because I just I haven't been exposed to many uh, different kind of units within the department. Um, I got to work with Vice. I really like that. We did like some cross training. Got to mm-hmm. work with gangs. I really like that. Just how they operate. You know, they're a small unit. Um, and the Vice guys, I like the plain clothes operating like that. Like that stuff kind of interests, that really interests me. Uh, dealing with, you know, working dope working the slap houses, human trafficking, like stuff like that um, really interests me. We got a lot, a lot of that happening where I work too. So yeah. plenty of work to be done. Um, but my front, like right now near term is just focusing on patrol. Cause I actually really like patrol, you know, yeah, patrols where it's at. Yeah, dude. I, I, I think it's fun. I like the schedule. Uh, so right now I just, I just want to enjoy my time on, on patrol and then go from there, you know, a couple, few years down the line and just see if I'm yeah. interested in doing something else. That's what I was going to say. I mean, if, if I could offer any advice, it would just be, yeah, do patrol for a few years, get your feet wet doing that. Get, I always tell guys, get really proficient at patrol Yeah, you and have you can to. really do anything after that. Like if you're, if you become a really good patrol cop, you can do anything in law enforcement, but to me, it starts on patrol. And a lot of people want to bypass patrol. And like they're like, ah, I don't want to do patrol. I'm going to go do detectives or whatever. And it's like, dude, you got to like, you got to be a proficient patrol cop, you know, master that and then go do whatever you want. Yeah. Um, and you know, like you said, I love patrol. I've right. done it my whole career. Canine SWAT and patrol. That's it. I love it. Couldn't, I couldn't ask for anything more. Yeah. No, I, I mean, I think that patrol is where you, you learn your skills and everything. And I've seen in my department where we have we have a ton of opportunities to go to so many different yeah. specialized teams. And there's so many people that are like, I just I just want out of patrol. So, I, you know, detect spot comes up, I put in for that. A canine spot comes in, I open it up, I put in for that. SWAT, whatever it is. And it's like, nah, you, at some point you got to pick you got to pick a route at some point yep. and it changes. It changes every day sometimes or every week, every month, whatever you want to say it is like, I, I had my career goal and, and I'm not where I, I, I would have said I was going to be, but uh, I think I also have one of the best positions in my department, if not the best. So, yeah. And yeah. I've, I've done that. I've done a lot of, I've done, I've been on three small teams now in my department and it's, it's huge. It's working that small teams is awesome. Patrol is great, but I, I do love the the teams and working there. And, you know, you have that guy that, you know, you're with every day. You have that supervisor and, you know, you have that, that leash is a little bit bigger. It's yeah. will hang you just as, just as hard, but <laughs> yeah. uh, it, it, it gives you some opportunities to do some cool shit. Yeah, for sure. When you get on a small team doing whatever, I mean, <clears throat> and it's a solid group, it's such an awesome, awesome thing. I mean, I told you when I got out of canine last year, I was with a solid group of handlers for the last seven years. And, uh, it was like, dep- I was depressed, honestly, for like the first year after I promoted out because I wasn't in that team atmosphere with those guys anymore. And that's really hard to, <clears throat> it's hard to get over. Um, but anyways, um, I see you going in an arc, so just the way that you, you're able to talk and, and all that and everything that that's where I, I mean. Not that I know shit about shit, but um, uh, I say get a dog. Uh, we'll get a narc, get a get a narc dog, and do both. Then. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> How many canines do you guys have? Uh, five, five or six. Did you ever work around? Did you ever work around them in the in, in the SEAL teams? Oh, yeah, all the time. Yeah. I, I was. I, I would assume yeah. so. Yeah. You ever get been in a bite suit and taking a bite from one from a I dog? Think, yeah, taking a bite, just the arm sleeve one. And then I've done, I've done other training too without when they're muzzled and stuff like that. Um, yeah, but yeah, they're like, they're like a really intricate part of the platoon. Like they're one of the oh, teammates, sure. dude. They're always there. Yeah. We, everything we did was, we always had our dog and dog handler. The dog handler was a platoon guy. He wasn't some like yeah, outsider yeah. coming in. Yeah. Yeah. You see a lot of cool dog bites over there when you were in the teams. Yeah. A few, I want to say a lot. Maybe. Yeah. Um, so I, 
a few good ones. And then the, the dogs were also trained on uh, explosives as well. So they saved their asses a lot too. Yeah. Yeah. That's badass. I, I mean, obviously I'm biased towards it, but of course there, you are. You, you were, uh, you, you ever see your canine guys working at, at your work? Oh, I mean, you ever work, work around them or. They're always yeah. going to the hot calls, 960 X-ray. They're always going to, they're going to all the, the, the fun calls. Yeah. Told you, man. That's where it's at. They like, the stolen dude. Fucking, like, they're going, they're headed there. They're... Yeah. Everywhere. Yeah. And where I work, it like, and same with him, like, we don't just stay within our city. Like, we branch out everywhere. You know, whatever city or re- everywhere in the region, we're going. So, I don't know. Yeah, that's how it is. Our, it's, it's a nice, it's a nice gig. A lot of dudes are fight, fight over that, those spots, man, because, no calls for service. They're just going all the good stuff. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I can't believe I gave it up. Oh, well. <laughs> Anyways, I don't want to go off on that. Um, cool, man. So um, I know you wanted to kind of to build up on law enforcement and, and military guys. I mean, what do you what, what message would you want to put out there for guys getting out of the military and your experience in law enforcement? I know some guys kind of shy away from it for whatever reason, um, but. I think for my, yeah. My back, you know, my experience talking with guys, you know, from the community I came from, like when you talk about law enforcement, like, then no, nah, they would just, they would kind of laugh at the, at the fact of even becoming a, a cop or a fed or whatever. Um, but w- being where I'm at now, you know, I, I beg to differ. I think a lot of guys would enjoy it. And there already are a lot of veterans that are involved in, in the law enforcement community. And I think it's a great career for, for vets who are seeking and still like for me, like becoming a cop. And I feel like just like every other cop, like this is our ability to, to continue to give back, to be the people that could help others who can't even help themselves. Like those, I think we could all agree on that. Um, that's why we become cops, you know, but those who are getting on the military, who are seeking kind of wondering what they can do, where they could still make a difference. Law enforcement community, especially now more than ever, needs good people, good men and women, yeah. hands down. Yep. So mm-hmm. amen. Absolutely. So we, we, we need quality people who meet the standard, yeah. you know, that we're not, we're not going to low. you know, fortunately sometimes standard low because the demand is so high, but we need good people, good experience, you know, and you don't just have to be military. So I don't want to advocate only that, but, and then guys in the soft background, you know, special forces or whatever, don't shy away from it. And a lot of times I, I came across this too, where people are like, you're becoming a cop. Like I'm like stepping down in my career. Like I'm mm-hmm. becoming a lesser, I don't know, person or whatever. Yeah. Uh, like I've taken a step down by a step up in my career path of becoming just a, a street cop. Yeah. Um, I've, I experienced that for my family members. They kind of like, they kind of sneaker like, what? Like, why would you want to ever do that? Um, yeah. Mm-hmm. I'm sure you've experienced the same thing. So it's yeah. From various types of people. Yeah. yeah. So I, I think there's that stigma there too. Uh, but dude, guys in my background, I think they would thrive if they just suck it up, deal with the, you know, it's a pain. Don't, you know, I'm not going to sugarcoat this. It's a pain in the ass to become a cop sometimes. Uh, it is, but, and not every guy with the soft background is going to be able to become a cop because there's other things that play into it. But mm-hmm. If it's something you think about, just be, be an advocate. Hey, make the move because I think they would really enjoy it. Uh, but be picky with with the department you're going to go to. Do your homework, do your research, get to know people. Yep, for sure. I mean, I couldn't have said it any better. I mean, you're right. Do your homework for sure on where you where you think you're going to want to work. But, um, dude, it's a lot of fun. It's something to be proud of. I mean. Now that you're doing it, like you get to see like the behind the scenes of what it's like to actually be a, be a cop. It's not everything that you see on TV. Um, dude, cop, shit, dude, I, I think, think it's an awesome job. People take that shit for granted, man. Even I look back. Yeah. I was like, I'm a huge advocate of police, but like before I even became a cop, like I didn't know what the hell they did. I mean, mm-hmm. it's a freaking tough job. Being you yeah. know, just a new guy cop, it's free, it's tough dealing with people. And we're not dealing with the the best yeah. people in our society really ever. But so just and those type of interactions, like I think back, like every single day I'm on shift, I go to calls, even to all these homeless calls or whatever the case may be. Like, I'm always thinking about, I'm about to get into a fight or something like that. Like mm-hmm. that's always going through my head all the time, every single day on shift. It is 
being a SEAL wasn't always like that. I mean, when you're home, you're getting yeah. you're in training, you know, it's just training, you're locked on, but there's that, there's a the difference real world and training. And, you know, when you go overseas, it's one thing, but it's not every day of your career. And yeah, as a, that's why I think it's, it's a tough, it's a fucking tough job. Yep. And you always got to be on your toes. I mean, and, and unfortunately in our job, you always got to be on your A game because you never know when you're going to come across someone that decides he was having a bad day. Like he, he wants to kill you. So like when you're going to calls and stuff, you know, like not getting complacent and, you know, look, always looking around, like what's, what's good cover for me. If I have to get to cover or concealment or, or whatever, like you just, in our job, you always got to be paying attention to all the, like the little things oh, yeah. and, you know, you can't, you can't get caught up in being complacent on the small stuff because damn, man, that's the stuff that gets you, you know, every time. So that's the hard part about our job, yeah, I think. And not to mention patrol in law enforcement is the hardest and the most dangerous job in any agency. For sure. I, I mean, I know that, you know, our tactical guys will sit there and be like, I do these entries and stuff like that. You know, th- those are all planned. You know what you're, you, you know, somewhat of what you're going into and you know that inherent risk of doing it. So you're planned for it. How many vehicle stops have you done? And you'll do plenty of them where you, you hopefully you don't get complacent, but at some point you're, you know, you're walking up to a car at night. Like I don't you're know what's on, in it. The tint windows are all tinted and you're like, I have no idea. This guy could be sitting there with a, with a AR rifle pointing at me right now. And I'm walking up like it's nothing. And there's nothing you can do about it. Honestly, it's tinted windows. You can, you can plan for it and hope for it, but it, it, it it's there there's a risk that's there and yeah we can't smash out windows just because there's a risk or something yeah. i agree yeah the yeah. amount of cars i've pulled over thus far i mean i look i think back my gun's out you know 80 percent of the time my gun is out because we're not pulling over the yeah you know 2 a.m <laughs> soccer mom soccer moms running the stop yeah. sign you know like that's not the type yep. of people we're dealing with you're already going in yeah. there like my mindset is this dude wants to fight me he's a crook or he, he, he may have a gun or something. Mm-hmm. So it's that shit's always running through my head. Like in the, like the, the small minutia stuff, it's easy to become complacent. You're right. Like just controlling people, watching people, watching your environment, watching other people mm-hmm. around you, you know, having that command presence, controlling you know, your subject or whatever, cupping them up. Yeah. Uh, going in, Hey, when is the right time to go hands on? You know, it's, there's a lot to think about. Uh, and it, like you go from like, hey, I'm eating fucking lunch on the hood of my car behind Target, and next thing you know, like, we're doing a foot pursuit. We're getting a call like, yeah, hey, dude, yeah. one of our buddies is doing a ten, th- you know, is in trouble. We need a foot pursuit or whatever. So it's yeah. yeah, it goes from like complete chill to like ramp up, and half the time it's it goes ramp up when you're like eating lunch or whatever. You're not even doing. So you're yeah. kind of relaxed, and all of a sudden it gets fucking. Now you're in a pursuit. Yep. Well, well, that brings up two things that I wanted to bring up is like, you can't stretch, you can't prepare, you can't do anything before, you know, it, it happens like that. So always be ready. And that, that I think physical fitness and doing your, your part is huge, both mentally and physically in this, this job. And my other thing is to new cops, what out there, if you can cuff somebody, you can detain somebody, whatever, do it. I don't care if it's grandma, if you have the authority and the the right to detain them, Put them in handcuffs because hopefully if you put them in handcuffs, you're patting them down. That that threat is is very much lowered or mitigated to it to a certain extent. So so do what you can and do. And you can always take them off. Put you give yourself a cheating. Yeah, 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 yeah. And and I would imagine for you know, in a guy in your shoes with your background, like being a cop, you're always thinking about tactics. Like tactics are huge. Tactics are what are what going to save your life, right? So I mean. Yeah. Um, well, taxes are going to save your life. Case law, department policy, and state law or whatever are yeah. going to save your life probably just as many times, and they're going to save your job. Those so, will save so, your house. Yeah. I mean, but they'll save your life too, knowing knowing when you can do something and when you can't yeah. do something. Because so many people or so many cops are like, uh, can I do – it's like, yeah, I can, I can beat this. I can get in a physical altercation with this guy because he did this, this, this. And if you understand that policy and you know it, then you know when you can do something and when you can't. And then you just, that, that hesitation isn't there. And that hesitation is what is going to get you hurt. Yeah. Or yeah knowing those yeah, things, I, I, I'm still learning them, you know, but 
th- those are like our ammunition as cops, knowing case law, yeah, knowing yeah. PC, our PC, what's our PC, what's our platform. Those are our tools to do our job effectively, essentially. And yeah, if there's if there's any type of doubt, which I came across being new, like, but can I detain this guy? Can I start questioning this guy? Is he detained? Mm-hmm. Is he not? Or is he in custody at the Miranda or et cetera? You know, like you have that doubt sometimes because you're unsure. But I think mm-hmm. if I try to make it a point like, hey, I'll make sure I know my platform. They always preach that in our arm. Like, hey, what know your platform? Why yeah. know why you're doing what you're doing? And then hey, you could articulate it all day on your yep. report. That's yeah. Yeah. I think that's huge. Um, that's huge. No, no, what you can, yeah. you cannot do. Yeah, and if you're, and I always preach, be on the offensive. And the only way you can be on the offensive is if you know your policy. Because I don't want to start. I, I don't want to have to defend myself. I want to, I want to be out there taking care of it before it. Because defense is a hell of a lot harder than offense when it comes to uh, life saving and and your own your own life and your partner's life and the community's life. Yeah, yeah. I mean, so it sounds like so far you've enjoyed it. Yeah, so far I've enjoyed it. I, I'm sure there'll be times where I'll, I'll be like, you know, screw this. But that's with every job, dude. I, it's conducive to my lifestyle. I feel, you know, I, I I enjoy. I look forward to going to work. You know, so I think that's important for me. Uh, can't be three days a week, and I, I get to be out there and still making a difference in whatever my little sphere of influence as much as I can. But yeah. yeah. Well, you also get to kind of be the face of, you know, where your background, you know, like influencing other guys to like, Hey, when you guys get out, it's like, there's this out, there's this other outlet you can go where, which is pretty similar to like yeah. the military background. Everything um, carries over, man. All that shit is just going to benefit you. And you just got to be, you just got to like yeah. be motivated to go through the process. That's all. I think that's what deters people and, and like all this frivolous media, of, you know, people get in trouble and stuff like that. I think they just need to ignore people, ignore the noise. Hey, a lot, you're 90, 99% of the people are fucking rock solid doing the right thing. You know, any department entity or whatever, there's always those bad apples, no matter what we do, but sure. Oh yeah, Everywhere. exactly. So I don't, even in the SEAL teams, you think fucking we're all badasses, we're all squared away, you know, not happening. That's not the case, but yeah. Yeah. I think ignore that. If it's, if it's something you still want to give back, still want to be part of something, like I saw that team environment, uh, dude, yeah, law enforcement community is where it's at. Yeah, cool. Well, I'm glad you said that. Yeah. Um, and, and thanks again, you know, even for what you're doing now. I think it's really cool what that mm-hmm. you got involved in it um, and you're still still doing it. So, um, hey, are you still doing the your business on the side, your shooting business? I am. I haven't. I stopped taking like, in doing like in-person stuff for up until this point like i wanted to finish academy training kind of get yeah. i want to be i wanted to be focused on the job um i think i'm, I'm going to start back up in the lessons um kind of end of this year or beginning of next year but i still have nice. like the other 50 percent of my business is online so i have a whole like online mm-hmm. side where i do like online firearms training videos courses fitness stuff so that's like the other aspect of my business. Um, but in the future, yeah, I'm going to kick back up doing some, some lessons. Probably just, I'll probably just stick with private lessons uh, at first and then maybe get into some group stuff. Yeah. I think the, the online stuff, I've checked out some of your YouTube videos. Like I should seriously take advantage of you're putting this out there for free. I mean, go on, go on YouTube um, and tell everybody where they can find your YouTube channel, your Instagram, um, your website. Where can everybody find you? So my Instagram is Travis Kennedy two six seven, and that's my IG. I do a lot of stuff. The main focus is Instagram. My website and everything other all other platforms website is Kennedy Defensive Solutions. That's my website and Facebook, um, and that you can find all the information um, through my website, all my trainings, um, and all and the contact information, et cetera, all through there. Awesome. Yeah. And everybody, everybody listening, I would encourage you to go check it out. He's got a really, really cool thing going, um, especially on, on his YouTube channel. Um, awesome, awesome techniques and tactics and shooting, you know, from basic to advance. Um, it's all there for free, you know, on, on YouTube. So, um, dude, thank you for coming on. Yeah. I, 
Thanks. I'm truly honored to, that you would come on our show and, and uh, talk to us and give yeah. us some of your wisdom. And It'd be my pleasure, man. I was pumped when you guys reached out to me. So, <laughs> yeah, we, uh, man, I can't thank you enough. Um, a lot of value, I think, in what your background is, bringing it into law enforcement. I think it's, like I said, dude, I think it's super cool. I think you can be the face of it and start bringing more guys in your community and into our community. And, man, thank you again. I really appreciate it. You're welcome. Yeah, and I think this is great because you just, this opens the eyes to, to seeing all the good, the good dudes in the community, good men and good women in the community, you know, and like guys like yourself experience good people, good intentions in it for the right reasons and want to just promote the, the job and recruit, you know, that and that'll just inevitably bring in the right talent, uh, which yep. at the end of the day, everybody wants. So. Couldn't agree more. Yeah. All right. Well, we'll wrap it up and uh, make sure you guys go follow him on Instagram. Check out his YouTube channel and his website. Uh, Travis, thanks again, man. Appreciate yeah, it. Thanks again. Thank you. All right, guys. Peace out. Hey, for our shot fired. Copy, additional shot fired. Shot fired, shot fired. Shooting at us. Shooting at officer.